Hello and welcome to a Burkamp Wonderland and Arsenal podcast. I'm Goody Gimley and tonight my guests are fat and hairy, but never ever scary. It's our producer, Danny. I'm glad to see you remove the GFP bit from that. I'd say, I'd, what You're can I do? Man. I'd go to your wishes. It's <laughs> cool. Uh, next up, Tinder teaser and Twitter pleaser. It's the man behind the numbers, Andrew Fife. Hello, Andrew. Hey, Gimli, how you doing? Oh, it's nice to hear that voice again. Where where you been? I've uh, I've been hiding, waiting to come out for this uh, this Valentine's Day special. You could it's, just tell uh, everybody you had a Caribbean holiday. I had a Caribbean holiday in the fifth best hotel in the world because I'm brilliant. We Caribbean? didn't hear from you, did we? On on the transfer day podcast, you weren't there. There was no people missed the five. He sent five us five. his love though. Well, right, bollocks to that. What's that worth? But he was in the Caribbean, as our Americans like to, as the colonials like to call it. I don't oh, yeah. need his love when he's already in love with another man. Oh. Next up, if you give our next guest a hug, you'll most definitely be touching cloth. It's Rev Patel. Actually, it's uh, Gangster Patel. I just watched Straight Out of Compton last night, and uh, I'm feeling very gangster today. So, uh... have you got your big chain on? Yeah. I might be I might be wrapping this podcast, put it that way. Have you got jeans. the gold plated slippers on? I have, yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. Have you got the old jeans hanging down the bottom of the arse? Well they always do anyway, so don't worry about that. That's only how's, you... how's life, Gimli? How, how's your week been? It's been, it's been very good. So... I've heard you, I've heard you've been cha- changing fish tanks and cleaning them out for the last twenty three hours or something. Yeah, yeah. Last night I, I gave my fish tanks to clean out. It's a it's a big job. Do you I get in it to do it. it. No, but I could have. Hmm. They are they are pretty massive. Right, we'll move on. The jungle is massive, I heard. Boyaka, boyaka. Uh, and finally, the hidden gem amongst the shit. It's Guna Girl Kate. Hello. You got a nice intro. The rest of I us. I did get a nice. That's only because you know you'll be sleeping downstairs otherwise. Oh no, we can't have that. Puppies, dogs, cats. Yay. No. Oh, what is the puppy situation? They're all sold, not to new homes, but they've had all deposits and are waiting to go to their new owners next weekend. So we Sad will be a, a puppy-free household next weekend. Sad I, times. I think last time that we we did this and your puppies went away, you couldn't do the pod because you were so upset. I That's think how much she loves them. I know. I, I will be doing this one, though, and it will just be through tears that you shall hear me host. Sad times. Right. As always, then, we'll kick it off by going over to the Fat Man for all of the scores across the board and a lone watch. This week, I've mostly been eating eggs. <laughs> oh, and I have decided that, you know, there's everyone can describe themselves whatever gender they want. And there, a school recently had you could pick from one of 25 genders. This week, I am helicopter. OK. What so, were you last week? Jedi? Sponge. Oh, fair enough. Yes. But don't Don't hate me. So next week, are you going to be cucumber? Marzipan. Oh. Cucumbers the week after. Is it too sugary though? Diabetes. Think about that. Oh, yes. I mean, you are you are a, a heavy set gentleman. I am. Well, That's I say right. set. Uh, a heavy sat gentleman. <laughs> God, he's on one tonight. Oh, I'm good. <laughs> uh, shut up. I'm doing my bit. All right, Damian Martinez. Uh, he wasn't in the squad as Wolves drew one nil nil at Reading. They're now eleventh. Ashley Maitland Niles. Oh, I've done it again, haven't I? Said Ashley. It's Ainsley. Actually, someone thought if that was an in-joke, I think it was, uh, um, oh, matey boy in Egypt, whose name I can't remember. Danny, we'll do it again, do it again. Ahmed. They'll never know. Uh, Ainsley Maitland-Niles. Conservative. Thank you very much, I'm glad I didn't fuck that up. He was an unused sub as Ipswich went to QPR and lost 1-0. Ipswich are now 7th. Chupa Chupa Apcom and Isaac Hayden, both playing for Hull. Uh, They lost 1-0 at Burnley, because Burnley are on a hell of a run. Chupa Chupa played 14 minutes as he came on in the 76th minute as a sub. And... Zach played the full 90 minutes in central midfield. Hull are now second, one point behind Middlesbrough, who are first, obviously. Uh, Super John Terrell, future, oh, I don't know, Spanish. England, England, England legend. England legend, that's it. John played in the Urzel hole, and then Birmingham lost 2-1 at home to Sheffield Wednesday, who are on a hell of a roll. Birmingham are now eighth and dropping. Uh, Wellington Silver, welly to his mate, started and played uh, 81 minutes. He played in the Sanchez role. Uh, as they beat Rotherham 2-1 at home. That's two wins and a draw in the last three for Bolton now. Bolton are 23 
are 23rd and four points from safety and uh, our wishes go out to uh, the Garside family because uh, very sadly their, their chairman who was a nice bloke and did a lot for football he passed away the other day aged only 63 so a couple of times I've mentioned my mate Mick Dagger the postman in Bolton so if you know Mick Dagger go give him a hug because he'll probably be sad and it's sad Bolton are £180 million pound in debt <sighs> sad times. hold on well fuck off a minute Mick Dagger yes he's a That's postman like- it's like Mick Jagger, but with a duh. That's it. Yeah, he wow. lives uh, He lives in Bolton. How do you even know these people? Back in the day, we used to swap Commodore Amiga games. There you go, that's hardcore. We were part of the uh, the Holy Tortoises. It was, oh. a, it was a group. Yeah. Carry on. Thank you very much. Yaya Sano goals. Um, not in the squad, as Charlton lost 1-0 at home to Bristol City. Charlton are done and dusted. They are rock bottom. So rock bottom that if the rock turned up, he wouldn't be able to smell what they're cooking. Right, League One. Glenn Kamara, Southend United. He came on at half-time to make his debut and played in the Flamini role in the uh, centre of the park. Since his arrival, they have won all three of their games and are now seventh in League One and making a push for promotion. Good. Warshek Szczesny. Waza started at, as Roma beat Sampdoria 2-1 and Roma are now fifth after a recent terrible run of games. Gideon Zellalem. Liberal. Uh, no, 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 no. Mana mana. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> imagine an hour of that. Just keep, just keep going. One more time. At what point would people just turn off? <laughs> I can hear um, much tat as he, as he uh, scoffs into his uh, Ferrari Roche. I can, I can, I can no, no, just, just do it. Do it for an hour. Go on. Just non-stop. <laughs> Oh, he's he's managed to stop motorboating the the gas over. No, 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 no. He started and then he played the first 61 minutes on the left-hand side of midfield. They play a midfield three, so they have one defensive and then one either side of the defensive midfielder, and he plays on the left of that because they play a kind of 4-3-3. Three, three. Um, Rangers drew nil nil with Kilmarnock in the Scottish Cup, but they are still many points clear at the top of the Scottish Championship, which is Division Two. Um, the under 21s, round of applause for the under 20. 21s, please, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, they're doing a hell of a run. Uh, we beat Brighton 4 1 with uh, Ross Reese Nelson scoring a goal and getting two assists. Christian Bielik, uh, Stefan Mavidi, and Ismail Benaka. Benaka? Ben? B? He scored one as well. Plus, Matt Macy saved a penalty and let a penalty in. So that's 4 1. Welbeck played the first 60 minutes, didn't score, but you know, he's on the way back. He's doing good. Uh, we are now second, two points behind Derby with two games in hand and two points ahead of Aston Villa, who are in third, who have also played two more games than us. Top two get promotion. We could be on for promotion. Oh, wonderful stuff. Uh, finally, uh, finally, finally. Arsenal have beaten Southampton. We've beaten them 4-0 in the under-18s with goals from Joe Willock got two, Doniel Malin got one and one assist, and Josh Da Silva also scored. We are now sixth and no chance of doing anything. And the under-19s UEFA Youth League, which is usually um, yeah players from the under-21s and the 18s, a mixture of both. Uh, they lost 2-0 away at Anderlecht and are now out of the cup. Sad times. Don't need that cup. Who wanted it? Nobody wanted it. Get out. Not me. Not me neither. I no, want no, no, no nothing. No. Done all that. Well, there you go. All done. Is that it? Yeah, people oh. seem to like that. Good. Wonderful stuff. I personally, I switched off myself, but each to their own. Oh. Um, we'll carry on tonight's show then by discussing our 2 0 away win at Bournemouth. Um, so for his thoughts then, we'll go over to Andrew. Well, thank you, Gimri. So it's a, yeah, it's a bit of a pleasure to be opening up the uh, the forts against the Bournemouth game. I actually uh, used to go to school in a small town near Bournemouth. Uh, so all the kids in my school either supported Yeovil or Bournemouth. Eaton Wick, and they all wore blazers and top hats. No country boys, and they all drove <laughs> tractors and spoke like this. But um, but yeah, so when I, I remember going to Bournemouth actually a few times when I was a young kid, and they only used to have three sides to the stadium. And then a huge mound of mud behind one goal. And they had uh, two two brothers, one playing up front and one playing in defence. It, it was old times and it was a sweet times. But I, I saw uh, on, a, on a rival Arsenal vendor of entertainment that the ticket uh, tickets for the uh, car park remained £1. So well done to Bournemouth. Um, I thought overall, you know, it, it was... I think I, I put on Twitter something to the effect that it was not a champagne performance from Arsenal, but the three points was the most important uh, the most important thing on the day. And I know that sounds a bit cliche, but if you look at the form we've been in recently, it's not been very good. I read, a, I saw um, a stat earlier where 
I think from the last six games, Arsenal have only taken nine points. Um, you compare that to Leicester have taken 14, Spurs have taken 13, and even below us, City, United and um, West Ham have all taken 11 and 10 respectively. So everyone's bridging the gap on us and we really, really needed to grind something out. Um, if I mean, we, we didn't play spectacularly well. Uh, I'd like to point out people like Ramsey, for example. Ramsey, Ozil and Giroud, for me, were the difference. Um, I think when we spoke on the pod a few weeks ago when I was on last, we kind of talked about Ramsey and, and whether he was, you know, where he'd fit into the Arsenal team. And I alluded then that I always felt that when Ramsey plays his best, it's when he makes that core, him, him Giroud and Ozil. When we were playing brilliant football a couple of years ago before Ramsey got injured in Ozil's first season, those three were delightful together. And that's when Ramsey really exhaled. And I think on the weekend, we saw what Ramsey can deliver in that box-to-box role. Perhaps Flamini doesn't offer enough around him. And, and, and you know, perhaps, perhaps you know, there's still times when you think his ball retention isn't great. But he was involved heavily in, first, in, in, in you know, the first two goals. That, that ball he put over for the first goal for, um, for Alexis and, and Giroud to bring down for Ozil was well cast. And just his general play in the second goal for, uh, for Chamberlain's goal 88 seconds later was brilliant. Um, and so he was thoroughly deserved uh, as match, man of the match by Sky. I think Arsenal gave it to Ozil. You know, another great, another great shout for that. Um, but but aside from those three, it was a pretty average performance from us. Czech made a great save in the first half, but defensively we were quite shaky. You know, Bournemouth, you know, to their credit, has some very good opportunities. Gabriel, um, they managed to find the better of, where um, a couple of times I think Koscielny took to most part kept a Fobe very quiet. There was a, there was a lot of hype before the game around this kind of potential gem Arsenal had given up and not given a chance and, and he didn't really give um, Wenger the, the headline perhaps some of the newspaper journalists wanted to write uh, he, he, he wasn't great but that's not me trying to write him off but but on the whole Bournemouth you know they did attack as well Nacho Monreal was caught in six and seven several times by Pew, the Bournemouth right back and I think he was quite lucky in Monreal in the sense that Matt Ritchie, the uh, the right winger for Bournemouth, took just an inordinate amount of pop shots, which were which were terrible shots, and, and kind of he wasted a lot of chances for Bournemouth. But he really could have punished Nacho more, and it was surprising to see Monreal off his game so much. He's not, he's you know, he's been a very consistent performer performer for us lately. Um, I don't think it helped that Alexis has just come back from fitness, and and Alexis was clearly really off the mark as well for his game. And I, I kind of jokingly and mendaciously tweeted, you know, with a real Alexis stand up, because I, I thought he wasn't great. But but on, on the flip side, over on the other wing, we had Bayerin, who was full of gas. He 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 looked his uh, his his reassured self again after a couple of weeks where where he you know maybe uh, that his youth had got to him, and, and you know he hasn't been as consistent as before. But you know he saved us in in that in that great um, comeback. To, to defeat, um, sorry, to uh, support uh, Gabriel, and he was, you know, generally, he was generally playing much better, I think, with Oxley Chamberlain than he does with Campbell. Maybe because Oxley Chamberlain is that natural right white player, it allowed Bayerin to come into the game more. There was a lot more um, transgressions between those three, and there was triangle football down the right, which was good. Uh, so overall, I thought it was a good performance. It wasn't great, but you know, the three points are certainly what we need, and we now need to kick on and improve that form again. Mm. I uh, completely agree with you. Um, I think a lot of the pundits had started to question whether we would be sufficient total challenges or not. And, you know, it's it's a much needed three points. Um, I, I like what you said there, that it wasn't a champagne performance, because by all means, um, it wasn't. But Kate, it pretty much took 88 seconds to score the two goals and finish them off. It was it was kind of a bland game, wasn't it? Like if, if you were watching it with mates, you would, you would sit there and chat with them while keeping one eye on the game, wouldn't you? Um, but I want to talk about Oxlade-Chamberlain, who weighed in with the second goal. Um, we always talk about Alex being a confidence player. Just what do you think a goal will do for Alex's confidence right now, Kate? I think a goal would certainly boost his confidence. He needs a goal. He's just not playing how, I guess, fans' expectation is high on him because he has done so well up till this point. And he's just not playing to that potential. And I don't know, do you drop him? Do you give him the game time? What do you do? It's one of those, isn't it? Mm, it definitely is. And I think he took his goal at the weekend well. 
Um, don't get me wrong, I, I think he's flattered to deceive many, many times this season. Um, and I think he is a, a good talking point, and we will discuss it now on the podcast. Um, the Sun run a newspaper report this mm-hmm. week, Danny, um, basically uh, quoting Oxley chamberlain saying that he needed more game time, otherwise he might have to, you know, maybe look at moving on. Now, how do you take that at face value, Danny? I think he's he's trying to make a claim for it that he knows that Campbell has come from third, possibly fourth choice, and made it the um, as as the the legendary Louis Walsh is deceased to say he's made it his own. And Ox is thinking, well, if he's been given a chance, I can get a chance because everybody knows Theo couldn't score in a brothel if his life depended on it. And I think that the Wenger has listened to him, and Wenger's given him the chance, and he's. Uh, if anyone says step up to the plate, I'm going to hit you because that's a baseball terminology. He's taken his slot in the team on the right-hand side and played well. That goal he scored was, uh, was was lucky, but he scored a goal. And he's always got an eye for a goal in him. And he's full of confidence, which is a very important thing when you're playing out there. Um, I feel a little bit bad for Campbell, who is, uh, he's had, he's, he was the one keeping the team ticking at times on the right-hand side. And now the Ox has come in and hopefully it'll be sad for Campbell, but I, I can see the Ox staying there for quite a while. Um, we were talking to um, uh, um, talking to Ross, who's a Southampton fan, and he said he always saw for what little the Ox spent at Southampton because uh, he's a season ticket holder at Southampton, and he was saying that on the uh, that when the Ox did play, it's through the middle, but there's no way the Ox is going to get ahead because it's Özil first choice, Ramsey second choice, so maybe the Ox would probably be third choice in in, in the Özil hole. But for him to say that, it's bo- quite a bold statement to come out and say that, and then to get the game and then to play well and then to score a goal. So, yeah, onwards and upwards for the young man and uh, so much promise he's got. And he's, uh, I mean, oh, oh, every time I think of the Ox, I think that goal he scored against Monaco, that kind of flair, which is wonderful to see on the right-hand side. But he's, we bought him too soon. We should have, He should have stayed at Southampton for a little bit longer. He cost us a best part of 10 million quid. And we should have loaned him out as soon as possible, but he didn't. And I think that has been the problem with his, uh, he's, what's he, about 23 now, something like that? No, I think uh, he's a bit younger than that, isn't is he? 22, yeah. Ooh, so many years ago, eh, Raj? Um, <laughs> he remembers, all, all in black and white. So, uh, yeah. Thank it, you. Uh, that's, that's, that's okay. Um, oh, happy birthday, Mr. Fife, by the way. Yeah, happy birthday, Andrew. Happy birthday, Fife. Cheers, guys. I nearly be uh, I nearly be fifty like Raj soon. Well, it's uh, it's your yeah, in about twenty eight years. Yeah, Raj is but a mere real mere whip. Um, I don't, that's the right don't forget to send Andrew your your Twitter wishes. happy birthday yeah, wishes. Yeah, uh, at pr underscore who are you? We have and, no idea what that means. And he personally he told me personally he reads each and every one of them and yeah. he will reply to you all and probably he follow you. He probably will. You know what he's like. He's, he's a gentleman. Yeah. So the ox on the right-hand side, I love it. I want to see more of it. I want him to see him getting forward more. But he also needs to work out some kind of partnership with Bellew. And he can't go doing what Walcott did every single game and what Campbell did occasionally and leave Bellew in stranded on the right-hand side. Because then if Bellew wants to come forward, then it needs that, that um, usually uh, one of the centre-backs has got to try and cover him or Flamini is going to be trying and cover him. And yeah, So it looks good. And hopefully the, the team is starting to settle. We've got all of our best players back. You, the, the best eleven usually picks itself, apart from possibly the right hand side and centre back, and now maybe with Flamini. But yeah, all of our best players are there, and it's fantastic. Like like, um, like Fife was saying, Ramsey played fantastically. He got man of the match. He got a rating of eight point six. He got an assist. He had a hand in both the goals, both really really good goals. Giroud needs a nod as well for the way that he brought the ball down for Özil to score. But bloody hell, talk, that's when a world class player, the likes of Özil scores it has a shot like that and it goes in i think people can learn from that hit the ball with confidence and uh yeah you're gonna do well mm, definitely no, one, no, one's, no one's mentioned uh flamini's tackle <laughs> the one who was lucky Jesus. to stay on for yeah i mean uh you know that we, we scored two goals in 88 seconds which was fantastic we needed those goals we hadn't scored for so long but before that the money the probably the most the biggest uh, talking point of the whole game was in the eighth minute when Flamini went inward with a double footed tackle and only got a yellow card when we've all seen it many many times before a straight red and when it actually when it when he first did it I thought that's a red thing is and though so, well, right, sorry, let's, go on. Yeah. let's be honest right if if we're looking at a podcast we're doing a podcast as Arsenal fans we take the rose tint it's off it's a red card isn't it Quite yeah. simply, it's a yeah. red card all day long. Uh, well, all I'm saying is that, in some ways, although that yes, you know that the, that 90 seconds where we scored two goals was obviously huge for us, but even bigger was Flamini staying on because, um, 
my instant reaction was that's a, that's a red card. And if he had been sent off, we'd have had a real problem on our hands. And it kind of highlights sometimes his impetuousness, especially at the beginning of the game. He's always up for it, and he goes in. and And I think we were very lucky. It could have been a completely different story if 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 the referee hadn't bottled it and, and given him a red card. No. Uh, and, I, I, and, and, and you're right, Gimli. If it be, if it had been the other way around, it would have been Bournemouth doing it. Would have been screaming for it. Every Arsenal fan would have screaming for it. So, in some ways, we got a bit of luck as well on Sunday. It was a good performance, really. But um, you know. Uh, that was a big, big incident. Mm, I mean, no, definitely so. I, I mean, I, I think, again, um, you know, I checked on Twitter the team sheet, as I always do uh, when we play. And uh, to, to gauge a little bit of outrage um, from most Arsenal fans on Twitter, that uh, Flamini had actually been picked ahead of Coquelin. Um Now, Kate, do you, why do you think he's doing that? Do you think he's... Um, He's giving Coquelin a little bit of time to recover, you know, get match sharpness back. I think we saw him around the the 60th minute, didn't we, in this one? Um, are you happy that Flamini is playing in, instead of Coquelin? I don't know. I think maybe he's giving Coquelin that bit of extra time just to ease him back into the matches rather than put him straight into the team and have him get out injured again. But Flamini's always... He's got the passion and sometimes that passion can override and he does go a bit off the ball sometimes mm. and I guess but we want to see passion in players and if we don't see it we moan but if we do see it too much then we moan so where's that happy medium and where do you draw the line he does the job that he's there for but Cockland's, in my opinion better and but- Raj no, I think okay, it's right. I think something I said that um, he was a prepared to start Cockerlan in this game, and he's got kind of eased himself in, which is fair enough. I thought uh, I was just wondering uh, to you guys um, a question: Is was anyone surprised that perhaps El Nenny didn't get a game in front of Flamini, or, or or is it the situation where we can't trust El Nenny at the moment? And if so, then he's not going to get many games between now and the end of the season. Against I Burnley, I thought he was perfectly capable. Looked perfectly capable, anyway. But it's, it sounds like we're not going to risk him in the Premier League, doesn't it? He, he, might, get, he might get a game next Saturday in the FA Cup again. Wasn't? But you'd, you'd have thought if he's good enough that he would, he would displace Flamini. But it doesn't. Wasn't look like there talk he was given the game off because his wife gave birth that night? Oh, I didn't know that. Sorry. Another people I, were saying that he's he's um at his um uh not owner. What's his his uh, manager? What's the word for it? Agent. His agent. agent, his agent was some Jesus people were saying Christ. his agent. Oh no, I'm, I'm watching the darts. Um, his agent was saying he was injured, and there's, there's like it says on here on a um, fantasy football scout at the moment. It says um, potential reason missed the seventh of February clash with Bournemouth due to the birth of his child. So if they're saying he's a seventy five percent status, then uh, that's for the next game. Yeah, so I mean, Who hopefully, you, you'll probably gauge a bit more reaction on you know how Arsene Wenger views him going by the next game. But surely, Coquelin cannot be far away, can he, Andrew? Uh, well, let's hope not, because we, I mean, since he since his Coquelin's injury, we've looked like a completely different team. I think we uh, we didn't win a single game in the month of November, did we? Uh, we've been shoddy in December. We were thumped by Southampton, and since we lost to Southampton, we've you know trickled past the line against Bournemouth home in a way. We were absolutely diabolical, but managed to scrape a win against Newcastle, and then everybody else have uh, Albert and Sunderland in the FA Cup, and we've uh, and everybody else we've lost to or we've drawn with, and it's just really not been good enough. And so we need his stability in midfield. We need that tenacity. We need that ability to break down the opposition. You know, when teams come to us and they press high up against the field against us, and we haven't got anybody to, you know, to uh, break down the, their opposition in a way that's effective and that's not, you know, reckless like Flamini, we, you know, we, we're just stranded and uh, we need him back ASAP, you know, mm. for this title running. He's going to be absolutely critical to driving that team. Three more players that I wanted to talk about, and I put a tweet out after the game um, commending these players because they're kind of the players that just get their head down, uh, they do their job, and they don't really leave themselves open for a lot of praise um, just because their standards of performance are so high, people just expect. Um, but Danny, I'll put to you, Nacho Monreal, Hector Bellerin, and Petr Cech. Um, three of our star performers this season who have just gone about their business in 
just an amazing fashion and just done everything that we've asked of them, haven't they? Certainly have. Um, first, just want to say that we're the only um, we're in like five for saying that we didn't win a game in the Premier League all season um, for the whole of November. We actually got two points out of nine, lost five one to Bayern, and then had a home win in the Champions League. So what? Yeah, uh, that's a very good point. That without without um, the cock, we were we were terrible. But those three players that you mentioned already, people are talking that Monreal is is right up there with the likes of Winterburn and uh, and Cole. And maybe if you go back far enough, maybe Sansom as as one of our best ever left backs because he is just so good, so reliable every single game. But he's got the ax, the added bit that he can get forward, but he doesn't really want to get forward for a goal. He wants to get forward to help out, which is really important. And then he gets back and he does his job like Bellerin. Bellerin must be itching every single game to try and get forward because I get the feeling that sometimes he thinks he's a right winger, but he is so, so good. I mean, I think he's been told because he hasn't made as many marauding runs as he did last season, hasn't got on the score sheet quite. Remember that goal was it against uh, what did Villa? That... Was it Villa? Oh, was it against Liverpool or someone like that? Or, or... Oh, he did score against Liverpool. He did scored he? a good one against Villa as well. Hmm. Yeah, where he yeah. ran to the middle of the pitch to celebrate and they all took the piss out of him because he had no clue what he was doing. <laughs> but those two, it, it's so important to have... Um, a decent back line. It's been so many years since we've seen Arsenal have decent players at the back and decent wingers. Because uh, some, I mean, I, I did like De Boichi, but uh, De Boichi. I, he's uh, he only ever played. Well, I think he's played about. 15, 17, 21 games was in the Premier League in the whole time we've had him. So it's a, it's a bit of a shame that he's gone. We've got, we got hardly any backup because uh, uh, Jenkinson is back at the club with his one working knee. But Bellerin, he's so young and he's so exciting. I just hope that he's, uh, we have him have the, the Barca DNA beaten out of him so he can't ever leave. And what was the other player you said? Was it Czech? Czech. Oh, nothing you can say about Czech, is there? That man is the reason why we are still fighting for the title. Without that man, I reckon we'd be we'd be down where Liverpool are because he has saved us so many points all season. The bloke is just absolutely brilliant. Mm. He's my player of the season. He's, he's he is my player of the season. I don't yep. care what anyone says about no, Ozil. He's a fantastic. Doubt. But personally speaking, when, when that voting starts in April, May, I'll, he'll be he'll be top of the list for me. He's mm. been absolutely, and I was slightly negative about him. I got to admit at the beginning of the season, especially after that West Ham game, and I thought, oh my god, my my thoughts are, have been realised. My mm. my views. I, but, um, I thought we paid too much for him, and how stupid does that sound now? Yeah, yeah we're, well, I think we all got it wrong. We all, well, 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 many got it wrong anyway. Look at how many of us laughed when Ranieri was given the Leicester job. Mm. Everybody likes Ranieri, but they all thought that's it. The Tinkerman's in charge, Leicester are knackered, and now look. Yeah, I went yeah. against Man City. The starting 11 for Leicester was £23 million. That wouldn't even buy you Aguero's foot at the moment. No. Do you know someone else who has been uh, quite vocal about Arsenal players this week? Go on. Who? Perlo. Andrea Perlo come out. Um, and it's not just us that are fans of Nacho Monreal. Um, I think the to quote him, he said he has never, ever seen Nacho Monreal play a bad game for Arsenal. Um, okay. And he followed that up with Ozil. And the compliment that he gave to Ozil is that there is no better playmaker in Europe at the moment than Mesa Ozil. So high praise there, know. Andrew. Very high praise indeed. Although I would say I have seen Monreal have a bad game for Arsenal, but... I watch what? probably Blasphemer? more. Blasphemer? Burn yeah. him? Maybe he doesn't watch every game. Maybe he just watches the odd one. Or he's just mean, watched one. He doesn't have a season ticket at Arsenal. No. Nope. He's, he he's not light. an Arsenal fan. Fuck off. Everyone loves Arsenal. <laughs> they? Come on. Um, right then. Uh, I think we'll just about close this then. Um, I know, Andrew, you want to say a little bit at the end, uh, don't you? In a way to kind of wrap this up. And seeing as you started it, mate, there's no better place to go to finish it. Well, I'd, yeah. I mean, I'd, one thing, and maybe we can have a little chat. Why on earth do we keep bringing on Gibbs with ten minutes to go? I, I really don't understand it. It's cost us points before at Liverpool. We, Arsene Wenger. And I mean, don't get me wrong. Mate, I always hand, hold my hands up high when I question Wenger on this pod. You know, men of this parish shall know I've got it wrong many a time, and I don't take myself seriously. But we've seen before Wenger likes to make defensive substitutions with you know ten, fifteen minutes to go to the point that. They don't really add much apart from put us under more pressure. So when we brought Gibbs on before and we taken the tackles off against Liverpool, we were bombarded from long balls from the defence and they went on to score and we drew three all. And when we took off Alexis, who, you know, admittedly I don't think he was playing great, but we bring on Gibbs, we've taken off, um, we, uh, sorry, we've taken off Chambo, so we've taken off both our wide attacking players. And in the last 10 minutes, Bournemouth had three or four good opportunities where balls have basically been bundled from the right back. 
And it, it just seems like we're making not the same mistakes. I'm not sitting here suggesting we're making competitively, but it just seems to be that the substitutions are just very monotonous, very samey. And, you know, at times they're just inviting unnecessary pressure on us for for the sake of, you know, bringing on a defensive player. And I'm, I really don't understand the mindset there of why, if something's failed or it keeps to fail, why would we carry on doing it? Um, I don't know if you guys have got an, idea, an opinion on on it, but you know I, it, it really gets me when we just keep bringing Gibbs on. I just don't see what it adds, and if anything, I think it detracts from our game plan. We we very... had, we sorry, go on, Kim. No, no, go on, Raj. That's it. We haven't had much of a bench in the last two or three months, have we? So it's probably the best to have a bad lot, really. Uh, but you got to take players off when they're fatigued and stuff like that. I know. Yeah, you... of course. But he's got Joel Campbell on the bench, so I don't know why would you bring on Gibbs. But you look at Awobi as well. Uh, was it uh, against Liverpool that Awobi came on? And it, it's, like, it's like he almost changed the game. It's like he it gave us a new lease of life. Is that does, not an option? Look interesting, doesn't he? You know, th- that's got to be an option for us, surely. Um, well, maybe because I, the amount of money that he's on, or maybe he's got plans to, to shift him on in the summer, because he, he hasn't got a future at Arsenal. As he monry asked, I really think has just recently signed a new deal, so Gibbs has got. He's going to be best. He's going to be back up at best, and you can't really have a, a semi England international, someone who, you, as he's English and quite young, you could probably get twenty million for him sitting on the bench, or maybe mm-hmm. Wenger's giving him a little. No, he's not. He's not worth twenty million. He's he'll English. go. He'll go for eight to ten tops. Oh, Man City will have him. They'll probably give twenty million for him. They need them, don't they? Because they're going to get a ship a whole load of players out in the yeah. summer. Uh, uh, one thing we didn't actually talk about um, in the game review was the fact that Gabriel started over Per. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, that's a, a kind of a bit of a surprise because there's been a few people, if, if I remember, Steve Hillwood, um, he said about you know having Gabriel and making him the main the main starter in the centre of that defence. I mean, what are people's thoughts on that? Is is that the right decision to? To start Gabriel over Per, you know, has he got to be given the time? I mean, he costs sixteen million pounds, Raj. He needs he needs to be given the time. I thought he did all right on Sunday. I mean, everyone was going on about how a phobie was going to do this to, to us and do that. He's going to score the first goal and the third goal and all that. And he he shackled him pretty well along with Koscielny. So I think he did his job pretty well on Sunday. And I think you got to kind of have a bit of faith in him. He could well be the future after Pear. I don't know how much how long a pair is going to be. You know, first choice. Uh, at Arsenal. I don't know what we're going to do in the summer, but uh, I think we just need to keep a little bit of faith in him. I think he's decent. Mm. Do we do we think that Pear is being benched at the moment, Kate, because he's kind of uh, being taught a lesson for that mad tackle on Costa? Can I pretend to be Kate? Kate, she just said I'll be right back. Oh, I didn't see that. Um, yeah, I don't know, but I love you lots and lots, Gimli. Motorboat later, my darling. Oh, certainly. You're the oh. best love I've ever had. Oh, see. It's almost as if she was in the room. I know, your ginger uh, fluff makes me sorry. excited. I know, I rub it on her chin. Um, Andrew. Oh, God. <laughs> what? Uh, well, what's your thoughts on the whole Per Gabriel situation? Would you carry on playing Gabriel as long as he's playing well? He certainly gives us that. Mm. You know, we've seen many times this season that Per, although he is a great footballer in terms of tackling, um, he's been caught too many times with, with pace. Um, does Gabriel mm. rectify that problem? To some extent, yes. To some extent, no. And I don't want to sit on the fence. But look, Gabriel's been caught out as well. It's not as though he's been perfect for us. And But that's not me insulting him. He's a young player. He's learning his game. And, and Arsenal invested heavily in him for a reason. You know, his Arsenal used a data analytics company, which kind of ran huge, which runs a huge amount of big data to find these players. And, and, and he's a great defender. My only concern is if we're playing him, him, he is very similar to Koscielny, and we, I don't know, and you know, whilst they're both very talented players, just like Koscielny and Vermeulen were, Koscielny and Vermeulen just didn't work because you had, you know, two very similar defenders, one tenacious, you know, very two, two very t- tenacious defenders who like to get into the attacker's face, and so it just didn't work. But then we brought in Mertesacker, and we and we brought a lot of stability, and we brought a lot of balance to that fence. You know, to look at some of the best, um, the defense, best defending partnerships around. So, you know, Steve Bold and Tony Adams complement each other. You know, Carvalho and Terry, Gallas and Terry, Gallas and Vermeulen. They've all, you know, Rio and Vidic, they've all really complemented one another because they both of them bring something a little bit different. Um, and, and Calm's kind of cool head and shoulders, you know, has really helped Koscielny develop his game, I think, because he's been able to, you know, focus on, on his key attributes. 
And, you know, both of them are getting a little bit older now because Shoney's making a couple more mistakes than he does usually this season. Pear's legs are more suspicious than beforehand and, and you know, maybe his positioning is, is being caught into question. So, for me, Gabriel's definitely, you know, the, the future of that defence, if, if, you know, if Wenger wants him to be. It's just hard to think how, we, how we're going to play it because... Because if he makes mistakes, which invariably does, because he's a young lad, like you know, we saw Bayram has managed managed to uh, get back for him. But when he makes mistakes, you know, Koscielny's quick enough to cover for him. But I don't think they're necessarily the best partnership together. But then if you put him against Murtasaka, which I think would be a natural partnership, um, a natural partnership. If he does make those mistakes out of his youth, Murtasaka's not quick enough to catch up from him, and it kind of leaves us exposed, as we saw against um, Bayern away when we got hammered. So I mean, it's a bit of a catch-22. You need to give him game time to develop him, but it's how do you develop him in a way in, in, a, in a defensive partnership and a defensive system that benefits him, but also doesn't you know leave him exposed when he makes mistakes. And I think he would be exposed next to Pair, but uh, at the same time, I don't think we'll get the best out of him next to Koscielny because he wants to be the next Koscielny. So it's a tough one, but you know I think they need to stick with him and, and Wenger will work the work out like he did with Koscielny when Koscielny first came. But I've got a lot of faith in him and I think he's uh, a very talented young lad. No, very well said. Can I just um, add that um, his name is Gabriel, not Gabriel. We're not talking about hedge fund managers, uh, Fife. So, uh, did, I, did I get it right? No, it's Fife. I keep saying Ga- Gabriel. It's like the archangel or something. Oh, it will be an angel. Eek, eek, Sorry, eek, I eek. didn't take elocution lessons, listeners. I'm just... Christ. You went to private school, though. Did I? That's new to me. <laughs> you, you, you played for an FA Cup winning yeah, team. Yeah, for I have. on the Wirral. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Lines of cocaine and, and, and bumming at half time. That's what that was. I actually, it, yeah. Andrew, that's what I heard. That's what happens in them kind of schools, isn't it? Oh, I dear. You're going I've, actually, I've actually stunned Fife into silence for once because he usually have some sort of gag to take the piss out of me. So I just thought I'd get in there first today. So there You're you just go. Picking on him again. I know. I know. See, I'm the, the, court case at the end of this. The funniest bit is next bit on my notes. I've got ticketing with Raj. Um, but with Raj, oh dear. Yeah, that could be the, the, a good program on Channel One, half past seven on a Monday night. Yeah. Tick- ticketing with Raj. Exactly. Um, Exactly. But no, you, you've you handed the baton over to Andrew, haven't you? Who's done his research like a good boy and he's going to enlighten us all with the current ticketing situation um, that is going on within the Premier League and at Arsenal. Um, so, Andrew, uh, let's have your knowledge. Wow. How much is it? Well, no, uh, yeah, to be fair, I think specifically me and Danny, when Danny was talking today, as he does about the agenda, we were kind of going to talk about what was happening at Liverpool in recent weeks. I know, um, you know, Arsenal fans and, and Liverpool have both been in a very similar situation where they've seen prices hiked, um, not necessarily for similar events, and, it, and it's kind of sparked a lot of conversation between Arsenal fans. You know, there's been quite a few Arsenal fans who have been slapping Liverpool fans on the back and uh, and, and, Liverpool, and Liverpool club, and and likewise, there's been quite a lot of tribalism, which I've been slightly embarrassed about from some from Arsenal fans who you know who uh, you know refusing to give Liverpool fans any credit for their uh, for their efforts. So, I mean, is that uh, is that something that's a uh, cool cool agenda of you, uh, Gim? You happy for me to take that way? Yeah, go for it. Cool. Yeah. So I mean, the the big the big story that kind of stunned football last week, I think, was um, the the introduction of the seventy seven pound ticket at Liverpool. Um, that was, you know, what really sparked the ferocious um, the ferocious fight back from from the kind of the Anfield faithful. And, uh, and you know, and on the face of it, um, the deal which Liverpool presented to fans didn't seem. You know, it didn't seem as though uh, it was that bad um, when when they first kind of announced it to the press. But they didn't really engage with um, supporters club, I think, the way in which they kind of beat their chest about. And, and they didn't have any kind of in- engagement on that side. And so it came, it kind of blindsided a lot of their big supporters. Trust. And Liverpool, you know, as, as, so similar to Arsenal, are very famous for like the, the, uh, the support there. Um, but I think they, they came out and, and they announced these £77 tickets, but stressed that they were only for 200 tickets um, uh, a game and uh, and for only six games a season in their Category A games and you know maybe I'd be a bit facetious and play devil's advocate and so they did the research and actually they know that there are 200 people willing to pay £77 for the best tickets in the house um, but but nonetheless it went down very badly um, you know and, uh, and 
and, uh, and and rightly so. But the deal itself, kind of, I think Liverpool, um, the, the deal or, or the agreement they put on the table, it you know the seventy-seven pound is obviously horrendous. Um, not quite as bad as the hundred and twenty pound ticket Raj pays for for the Category A games in his club seat level with his posh seat for his posh mates. <laughs> um, but yeah, you. so there you go. Um, but you know, Liverpool, I think. What I would give Liverpool some credit for it is that, that I've heard Ian, and I take note of what Ian Eyre says, and, and, and in recent months he's mentioned about the, the big um, problem facing Liverpool and other clubs, and, and what Hartley's demonstrated is that there's no youth fans getting into the game, and, and local fans are being pushed out. Um, they've obviously analysed their demographics, and, and that's one thing I've talked about on the pod, you know, is how we're marginalising people, you know, university students, people on, on young salaries with low disposable income. And so I think it's great that Liverpool offering free tickets for school kids. You know, they're offering £9 tickets for Category C games, um, you know, originally. And uh, and the young adults, there was 1,000 tickets at half price. There was 1,000 tickets uh, a game for, um, for a half price for local residents. So it certainly seemed like there was something for everyone. Um, albeit the £77 tickets were horrific and, and, and it was right that Liverpool fans challenged the board on that um, but I'm pretty sceptical of how Liverpool have come back and, and I think they've really played a bit of a spin card um, I'd watched an interview Ian Eyre gave um, to Liverpool Fan TV I believe it might have been and, and before actually they retracted the situation he kind of warned fans you need to be careful what you wish for and, in, in, and whilst he meant it in a pretty facetious way, he was right. I think they're now being conned even more. And, and I know you've got some thoughts on this, Danny. Um, but, he, you know, uh, I think he, he he was mentioning around in the initial proposal, 45% of match day tickets were going to come down in price because the new stadium itself is going to cost them, well, the new, ele- the new element of the ground is going to cost them about £265 million uh, to build. And so they were forecasting that you know they were going to make about twenty million um, from the new seats, five million in sponsorships. So you know there's going to be about eight, eight and a half thousand new seats, and they're attributing about four and a half thousand of those to corporates. So they're really trying to build in that you know that Arsenal model of using the corporates to lower the you know lower the payments because otherwise they just won't be able to spend on players, and and that's not going to go down well with Liverpool fans. And I think Ian Air was kind of trying to echo what Arsene Wenger was saying last week that ticket prices aren't going to come down. Because if they do, because ticket prices, you know, it's all very well and good getting all this money from the TV revenue. But the TV revenue is largely going towards player salaries, agent salaries. And so we need the ticket revenue to pay down the stadium. It was kind of Ian's point. And, and you know, the Liverpool fans were seriously unhappy. They felt unengaged. It was very un-Anfield, very unspirit of Shankly. You know, the Liverpool Football Club have always been very proud, proud of themselves on putting, you know, the fans and, and the cop at the forefront of their thinking. And so I think that I personally... Um, was very uh, impressed with the way the Liverpool fans walked out on the 77th minute. I know, um, Raj, with your £120 ticket, you know, you'd you only walk <laughs> out if, if games get to uh, extra time. And so you can walk out in the last minute oh, of extra time of a, of, a, of a League Cup semi final, couldn't you? Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 on Radio yeah. 5, a, a, a Sunderland fan rang up and went, um, We had no chance of winning the game until they all walked out. I kind of wish the price, the tickets had been 60 quid each, we'd have won the game. <laughs> <laughs> but so they've uh, so you know Liverpool have now kind of retracted that they've uh, apologised sincerely, um, but I do feel that their response is slightly mendacious. You know, it's a lot of spin. They're just taking away the cost of you know that revenue and maybe doing what they should have done before and and kind of spreading that revenue increase thinner across the fan base um, because they really gave them, they opened themselves up to be attacked that 70 sound, 77 pound ticket. So they've done away with that now. And category A games are going to be 59 pounds, um, which, you know, which is obviously a significant decrease. But before in Liverpool, the 59 pound was kind of the superior seat in the ground. There's now going to be an increase in the number of those 59 pound games. So either side of kind of the centre columns, two columns either side have become 59. So if I was, you know, two, if I was on the penalty spot, my tickets just gone up from a category B to a category A. So my tickets now gone up 25% because, you know, that's what's happened. So there's a bit of a con there. You know, these nine pound tickets they're talking about. I've seen the views that they've posted on their website from these. And there's they're only all 10, obscured. Per season. Are these nine pound Correct, tickets? Correct, yeah. So, and, they're, and they're all got extremely obstructive views. So, you know, I don't really take that on board too much. I think that the, um, the freezing, you know, they're talking about freezing price and season tickets. Um, but, you know, 
it's not really the case. If you look at it, um, the number of um, of fifty nine pound games is only for six games next season. But the season after, they're getting rid of the category A. They're getting get, getting rid of categorization. So every single game, if you're in a fifty nine pound seat for Man U this season, every single game the season after is going to be fifty nine pounds. So thirteen games are in effect going to rise in price. That means there's going to be games going up more than twenty pounds and games going up more than ten pounds. So the overall price over the next two years, your seat for an average fan is going to rise heavily, just because they've removed that seventy-seven pounds. So I don't think they've necessarily, you know, done Liverpool fans this great justice and, and, and this great honour, which we're all hoping, which we're all kind of getting carried away about. When well, you really drill down into the figures. Um, so you know, I think that you know the the deal is good. There's there's been some you know there is definitely stuff we need to kind of um, applaud Liverpool for. You know, free tickets for school kids and getting more people involved. But there's still a lot of spin that I think fans need to get into. And and you know, it's this whole kind of modern football, but you know, it's uh, it's still not quite there. And I Doesn't hope Liverpool work out that an average season ticket holder from this season after next is going to be paying one hundred pound more. For their season ticket, two hundred thirty-four pounds. If you're in the if you're in the fifty-nine pound wow. ticket, sorry, if you're in the fifty-nine pound seat now, in two years' time you'll be paying thirteen games more at fifty-nine pounds, and I think I mean, it works out to about two hundred quid or something like that. So, if you take um, that, is it fifty-six pound ticket, and you apply that to the same equivalent at Arsenal, you know, in terms of season, let's just say Liverpool in the Champions League and the FA Cup. So 26 games as an Arsenal season ticket. So that would be about 1,500 quid. So that's, you know, that's more than the average at Arsenal. The average, I know there's Arsenal tickets which are more expensive, but you know, 1,500 quid would be pretty steep for an Arsenal season ticket. Bearing in mind that you're right, and everything you just said there, Andrew, you're, top, you're 100% right. What did you think of the way last night the mocking from our own fans towards Liverpool. You know, I mean, I was I wasn't very happy with that. I think uh, I was pretty disgusted by the way everyone was taking the piss out of Liverpool about Liverpool fans of what they did, and I think it's symptomatic of the way our fan uh, our fans are going at the moment. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that you completely agree. It was I think the whole mocking of Arsenal. You know, I, I put something on Twitter on the weekend. Where, you know about the mocking of um, mocking of Liverpool fans. When did Arsenal fans lose touch of morality? And when did Chips Keswick, you know, take over so many Twitter accounts? I think it's embarrassing the tribalism from some of our fans who mocking Liverpool. You know, they've put together a real movement, um, you know, as a as a force for good in football. Uh, you know, obviously appreciate that times have moved on and tickets will become more expensive. But we can't let clubs rip us off. And Liverpool have actually decided to take a stand. And it's more than Arsenal have done in a, in a long time. You know, every time we try and have ticket um, price uh, campaigns, you know, people talk the talk on Twitter. But I don't see anyone turning up apart from, you know, the, the standard handful. And, you I, know, they carry on. Gone. No, no, I, I mean, I'm, I'm quite disillusioned uh, at club level with the way... Arsenal fans go on about ticket pricing and stuff. I, I, I've got my my opinion is I reckon seventy five to eighty percent of Arsenal fans aren't really fussed about ticket prices. To be quite honest, and it's just a vocal minority that keep going on about it. Um, looking at Twitter last night, I didn't really engage with people, but a lot of people that I know well, and a few which I'm very friendly with, I was quite disappointed with their attitude, which was you know they weren't interested. I mean, one person literally took out a calculator and tried to blow apart, you know the Liverpool fans' aims and stuff like that with the with the pricing and stuff. But, you know, I don't think... I think Arsenal fans aren't really fussed about it. I just... Do you know how many of those £77 tickets there were going to be per season? 200. 200. 200. I know. And I think the only way you'd ever get that kind of response from Arsenal fans if they couldn't get 4G for their iPads, that's when you'd see the place riot. I think, I think they're just... You know, it's... It's, it's, it's affluence uh, Arsenal in some ways I mean you've got to be able to afford you know 800 to 1500 pounds for, for a season ticket and so it kind of it kind of excludes a, 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 a big group of fans uh, who can't afford it and, and those who stay aren't really fussed about you know I've, I've been sickened by some of the things that have been said I find it really disappointing because you know I, 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 I and a few others kind of campaign for this six seven years ago i'm very very happy that it's gone to a national level now and uh, other f- fan groups and other clubs have actually made it kind of na- na- headline news in the newspapers and in, on tv it's been on tv every day this week 
And so that's brilliant. It's, it's, it's you know, that, that's great. But I, I am uh, quite disappointed and, and, and a little bit embarrassed by, by the reactions I, of our arsehole. But, but do, you, do you find, Raj, that the same people that are taking the piss are the same people that moan about our ticket prices but are too lazy to do anything about it? I, f- I find, uh, sorry no. to find next, I know the question is for Raj, but do you not find a lot of the people taking the piss out of the Liverpool fans are the ones who actually don't give a shit about our ticket prices? And are more yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah, spot the, on. People... The, pe- the people who are taking the piss are the people who don't give a shit about ticket prices at the club. They're the people who are more concerned about defending the ticket prices because they feel they need to defend to defend every policy of Arsenal. And I think that we're at a stage now where people are so you know hardened by their stance and whether they're pro Wenger or they're anti Wenger that they let every single thought you know kind of take their minds. So we see this stupid tribalism where people don't understand supporting Arsenal is about supporting the players on that pitch. It's not about you know encouraging every single board decision. It's just, it's just wrong and. Um, you know, there's, and, and, and as Raj said earlier, you know, maybe Arsenal fans don't care as much because of the affluence associated with supporting Arsenal. We know North London per square metre is the wealthiest place in Europe now. Um, people earn the most money, and that's a fact. But that doesn't mean we should lose sight of altruism. Um, I think there was a guy who, there was an Irish guy who was kind of digging me out for on Twitter because I was, you know, quite vocal in the sense that I think that clubs should be lowering ticket prices. They shouldn't be pricing out um, fans. We should be custodians of the game. And then someone, you know, jokingly came back and said, you know, that I was loaded or, you know, just as a, as a bit of joking. And he said, well, that's even more reason for me to not complain. And I thought he, he really just doesn't get it. It's not about you know, the, how much we can afford. It's about, you know, who we are. We're not consumers. We're fans. We're part of the club. We're, you know, we're stakeholders. We're as much, you know, we're as involved as, you know, as, uh, as the players for wanting the success. Do, do you think, Andrew, if you get the people, if you lower the ticket prices, you get um, the bracket of people that shout the loudest? How do I put that in? The, the more, you know, average have a go fan rather than your your corporate man that's going to sit there in his box and drink and eat and and only going for a day out not not the fan that would stand there in the terrace and and shout his lungs out from the first minute to the 90th yeah i mean it's hard because i know i appreciate clubs have to strike the balance right arsenal have just got an expensive brand new stadium and they need to have an element of corporate entertainment in there you know boxes you know to some level we need to pay back that stadium, and, and we also have a market for those kind of fans as well, right? We we can't neglect that. But when the average price of a season ticket in the average seats, you know, forty five thousand seats, is consist, consistently rising above levels of inflation, that's when you're pricing out, you know, fans. And, and maybe you know we don't want to be too stereotypical about what what a working class person noise makes, but we do know that we're pricing out younger fans. We see that the age of uh, of uh, of Arsenal fans has increased dramatically. And, and that's symptomatic of the whole of the league. And so if we're pricing out young fans now, who's going to be the lifeblood of the fans in 20 years' time? How yeah. are these people, you know, my age and younger, going to, defi- going to get, um, you know, loyalty with the club and want to go home and away in 20 years' time if they're not doing it now? Why are they going to start doing it when they've got wife and kids? I think, we, you know, we're just really missing a trick here. We're, uh, we're turning our, uh, you know, the people, you know, the board, you know, we saw the way the, the Arsenal increased the ticket price for the Barcelona game and, and the animosity that caused between, you know, the sets of fans. And for us to now go and turn our noses up and laugh at Liverpool, it's just, it's just really disappointing to see people letting tribalism come in the way of what's a really one of the biggest, um, you know, epidemic cancers within the game right now. Mm. The reality of the situation is that, uh, and, and Andrew, you must be able to agree this, that... We, the ticket prices are never going to go down. They are never, ever going to go down. It's heading towards, in the, as you said, in the next 20 years, what's going to happen to our kids and stuff. Well, I don't think anyone really cares about that. But we've got American owners coming in who are investing hundreds of millions of pounds in, in buying shares. That's all they're doing is they're, they're buying shares into the club. They're not really reinvesting much into it. Kroenke certainly hasn't done that. But um, the ticket prices are never, ever going to go down and as fans all we can do is make enough noise to put a break on rises so that they think twice before they put the prices up and the best we can hope for and i'm not you know it sounds maudlin and stuff but it's true the, the best we can hope for is continued freeze uh, ticket freezes you know freezing of the ticket prices you know the uh, highbury harold came up with a brilliant analogy uh, the day before yesterday he said you know 
we were sold a loaf of bread for three hundred pounds seven years ago, and, that's, uh, and even though the ticket prices have been frozen six six years out of seven, it's still three hundred pounds for a loaf of bread. You know, so it's still expensive. Um, and I think you've got to wake up to the re- reality situation that we are heading towards the corporatization of football. And what we all experienced in the eighties, seventies, and sixties and earlier, I think that's in the past now. And, I, and, I, and, and I'm not being negative. I think that is the reality of the situation. Surely you 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 can see that yourself, Andrew. No, I know I take that on board, and I see you know prices aren't going to decrease anytime soon. Um, but then, they're not going to. But do you, do you actually think that they'll put the ticket prices down? They will never ever put ticket prices down. They can sell. I've been told by a senior member of Arsenal that we all know who who that person is that he they he they could sell every single seat in that stadium for 100 quid and and you know and that's that's, 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 that's really like melt it dry that's Ooh. like one one person lower than Gazidis has said that so Perhaps. that's to, to me and two others personally and so do you think that we could sell every ticket for every game 100 quid versus Norwich or they are heading towards a stadium full of corporates and and Day off, you know, uh, a one-off visit from 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 people. With their half and half scarves. With, well, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to, you know, it's 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 heading that way, and 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 all we can do is try and put the brakes on it, but it's going to keep going and going and going. And so we've said it for the last two weeks: the amount of money that's coming in is the kind of is, is kind of encouraging them to do that because that's that's the future for this game, sadly. What do you think to Matthew Syed at the time saying that he thinks you're getting good value for the tickets and if you lower the price of tickets, it just means more people are going to have to wait for tickets and that the black market for tickets is just going to run rife because then they'll just be charging people just as much money. If the tickets come down to 20 quid, I think he was saying, then the people are going to buy them and on the black market they'll still be selling them for 100 quid each. Oh, the, the Barcelona tickets going for £500 pound at the moment. My friend, got, my friend was offered £500 pound for his seat. So Ridiculous. it's 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 it, the demand is there, and you you have to understand that. So when you're trying to campaign and and, and make some noise, you, you are it's it's an uphill battle. But it coincides with the Premier League, every club being given a a massive windfall to four hundred million pound each for the the um, outside of the UK rights for the for the the um, the Premier League. That I don't think I think it covers the next four years, but none of them are expecting four hundred million pound each. And isn't it right that Arsenal make about a hundred million pound profit from each home game? So that covers the next four hundred. No, no, hundred million. No, it's match. We've got the biggest match day income of any club in the world. And that's Did I say hundred million per game? Yeah, you said per no, game. One mi- no, one million. Don't we make it's about a, it's a hundred million? It's a hundred million for the season. Yeah, it's a hundred million well, revenue, not profit. But what yeah, I would revenue. say on, on your point there, right? I think the, coming back to your point around. I, I do agree with you that we're not going to see ticket prices at Arsenal um, falling anytime soon. Uh, it, not probably not ever at all. But what I would say is what I commend Liverpool on their efforts are. They've brought in initiatives which you know. Well, what I mentioned earlier, maybe they should have Liverpool's problem with that seventy-seven pound headline and that rises. They should have maybe you know, as I said, kind of spread the increase thinner over a lot more people as they sh- as they have now but they've also brought in initiatives which are helping younger fans get in the game half price tickets they're bringing in you know free tickets for kids things that are gonna you know help help the younger people and help the people who can't afford to get into the ground you know um but, Spot uh, on. Ten, ten thousand seats at nine pounds for the whole season i mentioned that last night uh, and as a compliment uh to 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 fsg that's a really good man, uh, maneuver uh, and an offer, um, and I got knocked down by my by my own Arsenal mates who said, "Oh, it's only X amount of tickets per game," and oh God, it's, it's not. You know, so hold on, it's, it's something that we don't do. We don't offer ten thousand seats at nine pound a game. So yeah. you know, uh, sorry. And by the way, just to, just to clarify, it's ten thousand seats over the season. So, yeah. um, and not, one, not one other thing I would say is, you know, there's this. Um, you know, there's this feeling I, I was uh, drawn into a debate with um, some American guys on Twitter. And, and, you know, they kept saying that some American Arsenal fan was telling me, um, you know, the, the, the prices of tickets for the season tickets are actually really cheap because he knows fans who go over and they're willing to pay £250 for a Man U ticket. And my point was the club makes all of its revenue in, in, uh, in, in June, July from season tickets and it needs for its capital expenditure to take a very large amount, it needs that significant core revenue from Arsenal fans and that season ticket to, to basically um, account for its expenditure over the course of the season. All of a sudden it take, gets other money in from gate revenue here and there and from stuff like that. But there seems to be this idea that there's you know, 
eighty thousand Arsenal fans on the waiting list, and they and if an Arsenal fan you know decides not to um, you know renew his ticket because prices are getting so extortionate that there's someone else willing to take their ticket. But the reality is those fans are on that season ticket waiting list for the current season ticket. It doesn't mean that those eighty thousand fans are going to be you know st- going to stay there and be loyal to that waiting list. If we turn around and say, okay, you can get a season ticket, but it's going to cost you £500 more than what the guy before you was paying for it three or four years ago. You know, they, we, we need to be careful that, you know, the, cl- the club can say they think they can sell every ticket for £100. But the reality is there's 120,000 seats that are left empty in the Emirates every single season. And obviously some of that's due to season ticket holders that don't turn up. But look at, you know, tickets in club level, you know, and I joked about your, your £120 ticket earlier. But club levels routinely not sold out. And so if there was demand for these more expensive seats, why is it at games like Norwich, Bournemouth, Watford, why is club level, you know, relatively empty? It's because there's not a demand. You know, if people wanted these tickets, the game would be sold out every game, and, it, and it's not. So the club can, can beat their chest around, you know, how we've got this, you know, army of fans willing to throw money to get seats because we only have a limited number in the ground. But, the, you know, that's not true. People aren't going to, you know, be... You aren't going to be able to pay for these seats forever. The demands are simply not there. People might have the the odd will pay pay big for a Man U game, a Chelsea game, a Spurs game. But if you think they're going to do that in the tiny games, that and the, the club are mistaken. And and as I said, I think the strategy of the club is is failing to to create a sense of loyalty amongst the younger fans and, and the less um, uh, financially well off fans. And it's going to harm harm them harm, the, harm them within the next uh, ten to fifteen twenty years. Mm. Um, right then, because we try to keep it to an hour and a half every week, that's just about as much um, debating on the ticketing as we're going to do tonight. Um, if you have any questions for us, um, pop them to us for next week and we'll quite happily answer them then. Um, but thank you to uh, Andrew and Raj for a, a fantastic debate and one I think we can all agree with. Um, Danny, it's yes. up to you next uh, for oh. some Twitter questions. Oh, no. Right, okay, we've got plenty of really good questions here because someone got off his butt and asked early. Um, right, John at the Gooner Irish says, what would be your starting line-up for Barcelona, Kate? Oh, God. Possible. Whoever's fit. <laughs> yeah, whoever's you, fit and strong. You're dealing with the puppies. No, they're being felons. <laughs> they are so bad at the moment, seriously. They're, so, they're so, sitting there squeaking. So would anybody here not... Think we should. Uh, we're not going to beat them. We're not going to get through against them, are we? Oh, you got, so got, got, got to hope, Danny. You got to hope. No, you just don't hope, know. Hope. You don't Man, know. I don't want to go and waste our time against them. No, I can I give them a know. tactic, Danny. What's that? Uh, sh- shoot more. Oh, hello. We, we have to put out our listening. first eleven, Daniel. We have to our put best out our first eleven. Our best eleven uh, available on that day to play Barcelona. It's Champions League. It's playing against probably the best team in the world, and we turn up with anything less than our best 11, then we will get humped and it will be embarrassing. And to be quite honest, why moan about fourth place and going on about it if you can't enjoy these evenings? Um, oh, that's Raj, enjoying the evening. Raj, quick question then. Yes. I think probably like to, to filter down that question because I think most people can agree, you know, the strongest side. Um, but Oxlade, Chamberlain or Campbell down the right? Campbell. Yeah, yeah, is. yeah ever, is. does everybody agree with that? Campbell down the right for Barca. Yeah. If everyone, if everyone's available, I think the team picks itself. I'd yeah, treat it like we used to treat the last qualifying game of the Champions League in the group stage. Just play a load of kids because I um, oh, don't no. want to risk our players getting injured. Do you, if I gave you ten to one that we wouldn't go through, would you put money on it? Not that. I'm yeah. Good. Would you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course you would. Five at a charity. Go on, there you go. <laughs> now that means I have to give up 50 quid and I don't give up money to charity. Granted, it's is. a gamble, but isn't isn't everything? You know, who would have said that we'd have beaten Bayern Munich at home? We did. It will be embarrassing. to there People will take the piss out of us if we don't put the first 11 out. It, you, you've got to. It's quite possibly... It's it's a huge game. It's one of our biggest games of the season. And you don't know. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't. Uh, yes, most of us... You know, our heads would say we'll probably get turned over pretty easily by them uh, over two games. But you know, as I keep going on about boys' own stuff, this could be a boys' own moment. And and you know, and I'm not talking about the band, the Irish <laughs> band, by the way. So you gotta you gotta hope a bit. You can only achieve those hopes if you give yourselves a chance. And I've always said that about our transfer spending. 
give yourselves a chance about the Premier League by buying the players. Well, for Barcelona game, give yourselves a chance by picking your best eleven. But he's, he's got to have a game plan, Raj, as well. He's got to have a game plan. He can't go in there and go and treat it as if it's just a, a ten a penny Champions, uh, a ten a penny Premier League game. Like, you know me, I, I, I'm always up for shit or bust football, and that is the perfect opportunity to do it. Just go for it and see what happens. Enjoy the night. We're all going to love it. Even everyone watching on TV, everyone who's going to be at the ground, we're all going to love it. Alexis has got a point to prove as well. You know, Alexis, Barcelona. Alexis, Alexis has got a point to prove. Bellerin's playing against his childhood club. You know, uh, players want to impress. And, and, you know, I mean, just don't play pair, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I, can't, well, I can't wait for the Messi, the Messi, Neymar, Suarez triumvirate trying to go against our defence. It'll be fun. Yeah, I'll just enjoy it. If we lose, I'll still enjoy the game. You know, it's just, it's just exciting. For me personally, it's exciting. Yeah. The home game versus Barcelona is usually not too bad. I think in the recent years, they used to, you know, they come, right. yeah, they come to us. Yeah, they, they come to us. We either win, you know, by the odd goal. They win by the odd goal. With, there's a draw. And it's always quite a good game. And then we go to their ground and they go, ah, only joking. And then I, don't, I, don't think we've lost to, I don't think we lost to them at home. We did a 2 all and a 2-1. And then, you know, I mean, Nicholas, the, if Nicholas Bentley when, scored at Barcelona, we'd have gone through. I remember that. Nearly had yeah, a heart attack. We missed that goal. God almighty. But, you know. What was uh, the game when Messi scored, uh, Armuni was in goal, just literally that was, that was after in the half time. That was in no, Barcelona. No, no, at the Emirates. I know, so the one at the Emirates. And it was, we just, it was nil nil at half time. And then I think in the 45th or 46th minute, Messi scored. Was it Messi or it might have been Atto? I remember Al Munio was in goal when I, I think they beat us at home. They haven't beaten us at home, though. Have they not? Danny, check it out, please. Unless it was the game. Sure. We've only played them twice, haven't we? Two all and two one. Two all. Well, I, I, I have actually. Ibrahimovic beat. scored two goals. Um, that was, was two all. And then two one, um, Arshavin scored the winner, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, I, may, maybe Messi scored that one goal. I don't know. I can't remember, to be honest. So. Well, we played them in 2010-11. We beat them 2-1 at home, lost 3-1 away. And then the time after that we played them was the season before. 2-2 at home, lost yeah. 4-1 away. Yeah. And then, uh, God, this is going back into the dark ages. Yeah. Uh, no, oh, here we go. 2005-06, 1-0 at home and 0-0 away in the semi-final of the Champions League. There you go, right? see? We can, can, oh, 1-0 to, <laughs> to them. No, 1-0 to us. That's when, uh, that was, uh, no, I've got 1-0 here, home. That was in the semi-final, and we lost. Oh, that was the UEFA Cup. UEFA Cup, yeah, yeah. Not Champions League. Oh, was it? I've got it down here, 2005-06. Why have I got the final? That's, no, we beat. We played Villarreal and beat them one 0 at home. Oh then no, I see and then we what beat I've Barca done. In the final. I've That's got the, lost the in the final. I've got the top line as Villarreal one 0 at home, nil nil away, and then I, my, while at the time I strayed across the page, I had Barcelona as the one nil nil nil. Because it's all it's all tabulated, but our record overall against Barcelona, and I think this is about right. Played seven, won one, drawn two, lost four, scored ten, conceded seventeen. No. Oh dear! Just hope. Look, nothing, the... nothing other than the first eleven. Thank you very much. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, What's the betting we get a player sent off at the new camp? <laughs> Wouldn't be surprised. And um, we've had quite. I haven't got any lists here because um, there were so many people. Mr. Five, this is probably one for you. What do you know about Mr. Cronky's ranch? Because I had about five or six people ask about that, and I couldn't bother to write all their names down. But you know who you are. You know who you are, Cronky lovers. Oh, well, I've got a little bit that I've cut and pasted, but I'm sure you've got much more detailed information. Uh, well, I mean, nothing written down, but isn't it? It now makes him the fourth. Does he now? Is he now one of the fourth largest land landowners in America? Perhaps the bit I think... that I've written down says the property is spread over six counties, and Cronky, who is worth about five billion, now owns more than eight hundred sixty-five thousand acres mm-hmm. of land in the United States, an area three times the size of Los Angeles, four and a half times the size of New York. He now owns 11 ranches, which has over 6,800 cattle, 1,000 oil wells, and 30,000 acres of crops. Thank you very much. Um, but we have, we have only have one striker. That's the important bit. I mean, if Arsenal fans think that um, Arsenal's finances aren't helping Cronky fund this, they're wrong. So Cron- Cronky is mate. Cronky, I'm not sick, so we know Cronky takes money out of Arsenal. Bottom line is he takes three million pounds a year, in which I would call very shady, um, very shady payments, which and aren't. Is he the only one who takes money as well? He is, even though he only owns 29.9 percent. Is it? No, shady, no. Cronky owns 67 percent, so he's a majority shareholder. But uh, what, when a, a public limited company take, when the share, when the major shareholders take money out, they do it in a, in a dividend payment. So you take an equal payment relative to the amount you owe. So, so. In theory, 
uh, Kroenke should get 67% of what Arsenal put aside for dividend payments, yeah? But he doesn't. He pays himself £3 million and calls it a strategic advisory free. And then the club never really tells us what he's advisors on. So he, we know he takes money at the club. He's done that twice. And he also gets his own salary of 25 grand a year, which is, you know, minimal, but just covers expenses. Now, where Kroenke gets his real benefit from Arsenal is that we're actually pretty much a net debt free club. And by that, what I mean is when you look at the huge cash pile Arsenal have, it's phenomenal. And we also, you know, when, once you take our cash pile and minus the amount of debt we have left, the cash that, and the, the equity to debt ratio is actually really low. We're virtually a net debt free club, which means if Kroenke wants to go and buy something like a new ranch or he wants to go and buy, um, you know, a, a new stadium and he wants to do that through the means of a loan, the amount of money he has to pay back to, to the loan is a lot cheaper. It's like if you go and get a mortgage for a house, they'll say, fine, you know, this is your credit rating, we'll give you this mortgage, but you have to pay this much interest. And then you look at the interest and you work, actually, it's going to cost me you know, another 20, 30 grand because that's the interest in the house. And it's the same when you get a loan, you have to pay, a coup- you have to pay you know, coupon rates and you have to pay, pay service charges on that debt. But you only pay relative to how risky you are because the bank will take a fee relative to your risk. And it's all covenant. The bank will take look at Kroenke's empire. They'll look at KSC. They'll see the gearing ratios, i.e., you know, how much, what our cash to, and equity to debt ratio is, how quickly he can liquidize his position. This is all very basic corporate finance when you do issuing of debt and when, you do, you know, when you're giving lending. So by keeping a huge cash pile at Arsenal, it means that Kroenke is a less risky uh, loanee for the banks. It's less risky to have his loans on their portfolios. And so if that's less risk, he can then get access to capital much cheaper. So by not buying players in the summer, it really is helping Kroenke, you know, expand his empire, whether it be through farming, oil, through, you know, any American enterprise. And at the end of the day, it's us, who are the fans, who are losing out on this. I know with his um, his NFL team, oh you tit, with the uh, with the NFL team, the um, St Louis Rams, uh, he took over in nineteen was it eighty five or not? I think it's probably ninety five, and uh, now he's just moved them moving them back to LA to to be the LA Rams again because that's where they come from in the first place, and he's building a new seventy thousand seat all seat stadium, and uh, I think the, I saw the figure that three billion pound three three billion dollars the entire thing's gonna cost. Now, I can't remember where I read that, so I can't go and check it. But Gimli, tell me about the. Uh, I'll give him time to try and mute himself and oh, put down whatever he's eating. I'm unmuted. Tell, tell me about the advert that was you told me about on the NFL. I, although I saw the Super Bowl, and uh, we yeah, can't mention I, it in case I, the, I, Mr. I Schrader's saw listening. Something, um... That was advertised that basically uh, the the article was it's not only Arsenal fans that are upset with Stan Kroenke. Um, And basically what it was um, is the some of the fans of St. Louis Rams had clubbed together and got four million dollars and actually paid to have a 30 second advert that aired live. Um, in the Super Bowl adverts, which as anyone that knows sports or anything, there is no more expensive an airtime in America than the adverts wow. in the Super Bowl. Um, and basically it was a 30 second of commercial of a fat man stood there in a hat and he was basically saying how uh, Stan Kroenke has, has wronged the fans and that, you know, they're sick of him and they want him out and, you know, that they're ruin, he's ruining their enjoyment of the sport. Um, but it made me think, you know, these fans have paid four million dollars out of their own pockets to put on a commercial. They hate the guy that much. So, you know, birds of a feather flock together. You know, it's not just Arsenal fans that are angry with him. He seems to have pissed off quite a lot of people in sports. Have you got that list to hand with uh, how his Rams have done in previous seasons and maybe the Nuggets? I, I haven't because it's further up the list that I close the window. Oh, you are a silly boy, right? Look, good job I've got it. I'm just going to go through this briefly because most people here probably won't give a damn about it. But the St. Louis Rams in the last few years, they fin- they can only finish, there's only four teams in each conference. This This year, 2015... Well, you know what I mean. Um, they finished third with seven wins, nine losses. Season before that, fourth, then fourth, third, fourth, second, fourth, 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 fourth second and second. Some of the seasons, like 2009, one win, 15 losses. 2011, two wins, 14 losses. 2007, three wins, 13 losses. It's absolutely ridiculous. And then you go and have a look at the Denver Nuggets, his NBA team, 14-15. 132 lost 50 the 130 lost 52 season before 136 lost 46 
six. Season before that, they had a good run. But then, uh, yeah, season on season, all of his teams, I think someone said that since he's taken over, no team of his have won any kind of major awards. But I found out that the Rams did actually win the Super Bowl in 1999. They were runners-up in 2001. So uh, they are extremely fed up of him. I know them because at first his first link to us was uh, before we got his dabs on the, his de- de- greasy hands on the club in 2007. The uh, Colorado Rapids who play in the MLS and uh, the, the fans of that club are just as pissed off as every other club that he owns, and they were having protests as well. And uh, the Colorado Rapids are a joke of a club, and it's just uh, all the other things that he owns. So I'm not going to bother going through them all. But he owns so many, and then he passes like he passes them on to his son, and I think his son's just as big a hater of anything football-wise, and he has no intentions of doing anything with any of it. Um, I think we've uh, dribbled on about that quite enough. Have yes, we? let's have oh, the next okay. question. Right, next question from uh, oh, Kurt Ice, who's a bit of a cheeky monkey. He says, "Who is the most important for the rest of the season, Giroud, Czech, or the Cock, Mrs. Gimli?" Um. Cock. You're not Mrs. Gimli, shut up. No. He did an impersonation of you earlier in the pod. I thought it was quite funny. No. Did I miss that? Was I up picking poo up? I think you were. But have you not tra- toilet trained him? No. no. I still, I still go, go, I still go downstairs for my number twos. <laughs> go on, Kate. What do you think? Who's the most important player for the remainder of the season? Check. Ooh. Oh, but I don't know. Cock. Oh, no, that's a good call, t- Kate. That's a good call. Check is a good call, actually. What would you pick, Raj? Well, I think if he yeah, lets too many goals in, we'll probably, lose. Yeah, I think, I think oh. we need someone to stop the goals going in, so Czech is probably... I mean, you know, it's very... Uh, uh, yeah, Czech, I'd go for Czech. Slightly Gimli, above Cock. And Gimli, with your superb idea of shoot more, are you going for Giroud? No, I'm Just going for... I'm, on the end if you want. I'm going for Czech. Uh, really? Yeah, everybody said that he'd save us 15 points a season. I think he's already done that. How about you, Mr. Fife? What's, what's your thoughts? Um... Czech's definitely been the fashionable choice so far. Um, so I'm going to have to say Cockerland just to be the black sheep. Racist. Oh, um, but racist. We've, got, we've got Tottenham away, Man City away, Man U away. You know, these are all games where we, uh, where we need his influence in that midfield to stop us being overrun. So I think uh, he'll be a, a great come up. But, you know, let's not forget Czech's also going to be, in a, you know, he's going to be needed for that defensive display too. So. I'm going to go against all of you and say the best Czech can do is make sure it's nil-nil. The best Giroud can do is make sure we score goals and because we need to shoot more. So I'm going to go Giroud because we've seen without our goal scorer scoring goals how bad a run we've been on lately. So I'm going to go, damn the lot of you, damn your eyes, Giroud, all the way. All right, here's a, here's a good one. Um, ah, from Akshay, friend of the pod. Thank you very much for the SoundCloud, sir. Very kind of you. Is Stan Kroenke finally showing his true colours with Arsenal and, and the LA Rams deal? Are we just collateral? Go on, five. See if you can do that in under an hour. Yeah, no, it's a great point. I think the way he's talking about collateral was what we were talking about earlier. Are we? Is he using? Is he using Arsenal's uh, net debt-free business and, and high equity, high cash business to lower his his um, coupons for other businesses? We can't. Yeah, of course. That's why he's getting access to cheap debt because Arsenal props it up. Arsenal is, you know, very much um, a well-run club, and and he's benefiting from that um, from uh, for his other endeavours. And we're not reaping the rewards. So, I think, great question. I was itching my ear, my headphones nearly come off, and then I forgot to unmute it. Just uh, what, what Fife said. <laughs> yeah. Anybody disagree with with Mr. Fife? Oh no, not at all. Oh, it's sacrilege. Okay, Hoppy Hopkins. He's a he's a bit of a hoppy person. He says, if we win the league and the FA Cup, <laughs> what additions does a quad squad need for next year? Go on, Raj. Lay some truths. Sorry, I said that again? I was eating chocolate there. I was busy laughing. <laughs> Hoppy Hopkins says, yeah. if we win the league, you were motorboating and have a bloody uh, chocolate cake, were you? It's a baked chocolate cup. <laughs> you make me sick. I can't even look at chocolate without getting fat. He says, if we win the league and FA Cup... Getting? What, what do you mean, to... getting? Oi, oh. back off. Get back in your box. If we what additions one... do we need to the squad if we do the double? What additions? Yeah, for next season. Striker, can we just just go back to last summer and then repeat yeah. again? Copy and paste. By a goalkeeper. Probably probably two others because Arteta's going to go and Rositsky's going to go. I've got a horrible and feeling Flamini. Flamini. Flamini's going to get another year. Is he? We can't afford to get rid of three players. He's going to buy the club. That's what he's going to do. We cannot replace three players. We can't replace plus, one. Plus, buy the ones we still need. 
And I think Campbell, if he isn't made number one right winger, then Debushi. he's going to leave. Debuichi, he's, he's off on his way. Yes. Jenkins needs a new leg. Yeah, I want him out of the club soon, sooner rather than later. Gibbs. Well, yeah, Man City, 40 million. Take Volcott with you. Take. Another 50 million. If a massive deal, a massive offer comes in from China for Theo, I think the club would be stupid not to take it. <laughs> yeah, as long as they don't pay him in, uh, what do they use there? Yuan, isn't it? What yeah. the currency yeah. do they use there? Yeah, Y-U-A-N. Yeah. Because that's devaluing like a, a loaf of mouldy bread. Um, okay, another question. from. Oh, this is another one where many people have asked. Aaron Anthony, A.B. Guna, and another one asked... Should we move Ramsey to the right and try El Nenny next to Cock, or hope the Ox and Joel find form again? Go on, Gimli, give that a tickle. Um, I don't know. I'm not a fan of Ramsey down the right hand side. I'm really not. Oh, I, my. I, I agree with you. I, I don't think Joel Campbell's done a particularly bad job. You know, players mm. uh, lose form. Uh, I think he, if he plays through it, you know. Ox is always a viable option. Uh, I think, you know, he's been given a chance, but he can play through his form. We both know that there's a player there. Um, so I guess I, I'd stick with uh, Joel Campbell down the right-hand side and I'd keep Ramsey playing th- that role that he plays next to Cazorla. Kate, do you agree with the Goblin? I agree with the Goblin. Oh, but you sound like you're distracted again. No, <laughs> it, it doesn't happen often, but I agree with him this time. Jesus, whatever next, the moon's going to fall. Okay, next question from Ellis Mill. He says, oh, this is, he, he has got a, 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 a PS at the end of this. If you can replace three starting players with one player from Leicester, one from N17 Scum and one from Man City, who would they be? And then his PS is, I know people won't be happy taking a, a N17 Scum player, but I never said you had to play them. So, uh, oh, Raj. Deli Ali. Yeah. Would you Morris. play him, though? Would would I play him? Yeah. Well, we play Campbell. It would just yeah. piss the it would piss the, the Tottenham fans off, wouldn't it? Play him, yeah. Make him captain. That just to wind him up. <laughs> double, double, uh, double. Uh, Leicester, Mares. <laughs> I've been very impressed with Mares. I think. Uh, who was the other team? Um, uh, Man City. Man City. I'd still take Aguero. Oh, it's got to be a Does anybody disagree with that? I think Raj has answered that superbly. I would mm. probably take one of uh, Tottenham's centre backs, to be honest. They Alderweireld and Kvartonga are playing extremely well this season, and I think I think Alderweireld actually got voted the best centre back in the league on a Sky Sports poll. Arsenal fans didn't win the other day ahead of Koscielny. Oh, yeah. What's going so, on? I know we were linked with Vertonghen back in the days when he was at Ajax, and he um, the deal was almost done. But Wenger said that he wanted him to play as a defensive midfielder, and he went, "Nope, not doing that." And so he he took for the uh, the other the shitty half of North London. All right, another question. Simon Hardwick, one of the infamous Hardwick brothers. Do you think Sanchez and Ozil will stick around if we continue to have poor or inactive transfer windows? Oh, oh, me, um, me, 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 uh, me, me, me. Um, who wants to answer that? Oh, maybe we've gone, Raj. No, no, I heard today that Sanchez is going to dis- is going to um, discuss his future with Arsenal in the, in the summer and wants certain assurances. And did I not mention this in the WhatsApp group two or three weeks ago that... Uh, uh, Pep is going to come sniffing for Alexis and Alexis will have his head turned by Pep. Did I not say this a few weeks ago? Did you not I remember think, me saying this? I think you did. I do. So it's heading towards that way. I am AKB. No, no, no I'm not AKB. Them. No, ITK. Sorry, I'm getting my uh, things wrong. <laughs> you and your acronyms. <laughs> the acronyms, yeah. You've got, you've got acronyms. I heard today, I heard today that, he's gonna, he, that he wants to discuss his future because he wants certain assurances. And I reckon it, uh, Pep is already tapping up players because I know I've heard that Busquets has been tapped up as well. Oh, biscuits. So, yeah, so. Uh, and Ozil, yeah, Ozil I don't think any other club would. I think Ozil will stay. What, what think, do you think? What assurances do you think he'd want, though, Raj? Like well, uh, a, a certain invest, amount of trophies in, a season? No, 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 no. Investment in the team. He wants to see us buying players. But surely that's a good thing. That should be investment in the team is by the by. That should just be a that's what every way of life. Person wants. Yeah, but he hasn't seen that, has he? No, no. no. he yeah, fucking hasn't. Yeah, it was since the last it, investment, he was made. the last. He was the last major, major kind of big player that we bought. The one that we were promised one yeah. every season. So no, he has, I mean, since right, he's since he's been here, we've we've bought some players, yes, and some of them have been pretty decent, but yet we haven't actually set the world alight. Hmm. I mean, don't anybody think, disagree? No, I agree with that. I think it's it's not unfair to say that they are certainly at a level where they're used to winning things and and they're top level players. So they want to be, you know, 
the, the fact we're third, you, you can see on Alexis's face sometimes, you know, that game when we drew with Olympiacos and he scored to bring it back to, I think, uh, two all, and then we, and we conceded minutes again. And you see Ozil's face, you know, he drops when we're not at that standard we should be. And, that, and they demand that kind of level. And sometimes when they're looking up and the players around them aren't at their level or we're dropping silly points, you can understand the frustration. Of course you know, they, they do. They're, they're, they're born winners. They don't want to be putting up with this shit. You know, nine points in, in, in our last six games is just not good enough. So, yeah, like, I can't see what. But at the same time, you know, uh, I, I do think they, but they both really enjoy it here. But, you know, they're, they're young players. They've got a short career span. They want to win all they can. Would you say? Absolutely. I think I think they've come from two of the biggest clubs in the world um, and they've got certain expectations and, and, they're, and they're, they're, you know, they expect the manager to, to kind of deliver in some ways. I mean, Ozil's been here two, three years now. Uh, Sanchez is, is in his second season. So, you know, this summer, I'm not surprised that Sanchez is going to ask, we, for, ask a couple of questions. We saw it before Van Persie, you know, gave a list to Wenger of players he thought we should be buying. A couple of years ago, before you know the summary left, we've seen big players. You know, our Thierry Henry so a couple of times um, publicly called for Wenger to make more signings when he was there, and, and I think Wenger actually um, benched him for a game because of it. But you know, it's not uncommon for you know top players wanting, you know, wanting to see investment around them. So, I, think, I, think, I think the problem that Arsene Wenger has is that we might not be that attractive for these massive players to come to us anymore. And I don't think Arsene Wenger's an attraction as well anymore, to be quite honest. But um, you know, if, if you if you're a player who's ambitious, would you go to Arsenal? And let's be blunt, not know. with the owner and manager, or wouldn't? I, I think it depends. Exactly. Yeah, I think it depends the scenario you're coming on. So if you're Ozil or Sanchez, you know, and you're the the second rate, well, you're seen as surplus to requirements from a big club. You might want to come to Arsenal because um, you know we're one of the better options. Yeah, if you're true. if you're at the top of your game at one of the big clubs, maybe not. But also, if you're one of yeah, one of the small clubs, now look at some of the smaller clubs around us, and we've seen it in recent years. They've had a lot more money now. They've got they they they're attracting better players from Europe, and so these some of these players are coming over from Europe, and and these clubs are taking gambles on them, and it's paying off. Players like Pae, players like Mares. Okay, they're not you know they're well, not. Well, Pae wasn't a gamble. No way. Pae was a good player. He was always going to be a good. But he weren't the player in sure. the league on that he okay. is now. But, but say, for example, Arsenal signed Paye, Paye for seven, eight million in the summer or 15 million. It still wouldn't be enough for our fans. Right? But what I'm saying is we can attract good players who, who from smaller clubs and we might be able to attract the big players who are surplus to requirements from the big clubs. And I think that the fact that you know, there's, there's teams below us now who are able to attract better players, it gives them a chance to settle England into England for a year or two, hit their stride, and then hopefully we can sort of maybe start capitalising by taking them then. I'm not sure. I'm just trying to think of the positives here, but you know, we do, can. Start... Do, you, do you think Leicester will be raided this summer by other clubs, by other British clubs? Cardi just signed a new deal, though. Hasn't It'll be it? tough. Yeah. They'll be tough. They got if they get well, they're going to get a Champions League, right? So, Definitely. so if you're if you're playing for a Champions League club, you know, and the money's going to be piling in, they say it's a it's a good place to be. From, from what I hear, the players adore Cla- Claudio Ranieri for what he's done he's to a them for this season. Everyone likes him. And uh, and the club look after the players really well. I mean, I'm not saying that we don't, but uh, from what I hear from Leicester, the Leicester side, that I mean, it's you know the cities and Liverpool's or whoever might find it a, you know, a struggle to actually sign a Leicester player because I think they're 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 a, a band of brothers in some ways. So and they're in, they're in just loving the ride, aren't they? So it's incredible to think it was. I think it was this time last year we played them at home, didn't we? In the game, and they actually yeah we or two one. I think it might have been two one, but they actually gave us a bloody good scare. That game, they they were, and it was kind of the Pearson era where they, I believe, on New Year's Day they had something, you know, they had about ten points, and they've really turned it around in this last calendar year. Um, obviously, Ranieri's taken them to another level, but we shouldn't discredit what Nigel Pearson t- turned around for them. And I think they had their troubles in the summer. They had, you know, the race scandals abroad, and they had the there was also um, uh, Pierce, the the son, the manager's son, getting into trouble, Vardy getting into trouble. And they've written, you know, Claudio's come in and, and actually he used to be called the Tinker Man because at Chelsea he played a different team. But he's, he's got a core nucleus of players and maybe you can say they've got a little bit of luck where they haven't had too many injuries. But he's kept that core nucleus of players just playing so well. And, and they're really, you can tell as Rod said, they're loving playing for each other. Some of their football is just peak Arsenal. This attacking flair. I remember that goal we scored against Norwich a few years ago where Wilshire scored that cracking goal. 
they're playing almost yeah, that yeah, kind of football. Yeah. They're playing with just, you know, no fear. Okay. There's arrogance. Facts of panache. confidence. It's brilliant to see, yeah. But... Yeah, so We're looking at the the Pie thing again, how, how long ago would it have been that West Ham would have got a half decent player and they'd have had him for six months and then all people come in and, and make and want to buy him? He's just signed he's only been there seven months now they've upped his wages today to hundred and twenty five grand a week. Wow. It wouldn't have been that long ago that West Ham would have been looking to cash in on him as soon as possible. Yeah. And then you look, you look at Leicester, people are going, oh, Leicester, they won't be able to keep this up. You look at the running they had last season. There's just as much, there's probably more pressure on you to not go down the position they were last season. There is the pressure that's on them now because nothing is expected of them now. And they are not going to be a pushover and everybody is scared. I mean, look what they did to Man City, although a team in turmoil themselves. Not many teams go there and hammer them the way they did and they were confidently beaten. And you, and the way then, and the, the 125 grand is isn't actually money that West Ham really have now. It's the importance of the money that's coming in from this huge TV deal and the extra money we're going to see. Clubs like West Ham haven't started just to suddenly make you know lots more. They haven't yet. Cause what Stoke and Newcastle did in the, the winter transfer window. Yeah, precisely. And what, they're, what these teams are, are leveraging the money that's coming in and saying, listen, if we, you, what we will do is buy players from you now in the hope that it keeps them up so they can get that big money. And they're already giving away a percentage of the profit of the TV money they're going to make. So they're already investing this money they haven't got because they know how much is going to come in. So they're you know, holding down these top stars. And I think it was last summer on the last day of the window where actually Arsenal sort of got linked to Mares and got linked to James Wilson. Everton were going for stones. And these clubs just weren't going to sell. And I said then, if you think it's bad now trying to buy players from smaller English clubs, who think they don't have to sell now? Just wait. How bad it's going to be? You know, it's only going to become perpetual in seasons when they've got huge money. And you know, people laughed at the time, and, and you know, and I said, it, you know, we're actually by not signing now, we're missing out on a big opportunity. We're missing out on a big opportunity before it becomes even harder. And I think Wenger even came out and said it the other day. He said things are going to become a lot harder when money becomes in because pl- clubs are going to have a lot more money. They're not going to need to sell. So I think Darren Arsenal made a good point. You know about how our uh, manager, you know, has hinted. You know how it's going to become hard to sign, you know, loads of players. So why don't we use that cash to buy them when we, it was less, you know, when it was easier? But, but you know, but there, there's some real talent, and, and and these big clubs, it's going to be much harder to, you know, prize away their assets. Just look at, at Chelsea last summer; they threw 40, 50 million at Everton for stones. So how much is it going to be worth next year? You know, Lukaku. How how is how is a team like Arsenal going to be able to prize Lukaku away from Everton? I just don't think they are. I mean, I know I mean, we've got to get a move on, but you just look at Derby. How many times in the history of football has a, a, a second-tier team spent £25 million on some quality players and then because the team are three points off promotion, then the, the manager, they sack them after eight months? I mean, that just shows the, the, the mad scramble there is in the league below to get promotion because the, the, the pot of gold is there for whoever can get it. I mean, to sack um, uh, Clement is absolutely mental. And they said they wouldn't do it, but they have. Right. We've got to move on. I've got some really good questions. Um, okay, one from Tyrone who made his. What is he? What is he, Gimli? Is he our resident artist? Yeah, he is our resident artist. And he's, he's he was made his debut on the transfer deadline day. And if he can sort out his um his equipment, he might even get a a slot on the radio show. Because I think uh, Chris said maybe yes. Um, he said, would it be considered a massive failure if Arsenal doesn't win the title this year, given that we've we're out of excuses for the for three years in a row now, Gimli? Um, yeah, I think it is. I think now is the time to put up or shut up. Um, FA Cups are fantastic. Not not going to knock the FA Cup. I think, you know, we we all cheered loudly and, and love the fact that we are defending champions of, of the FA Cup. Um, but it's not a league title, is it? I think as a football supporter, we all, our common goal is we all want to see the club be the best in the country. Um, and... I don't think there's any excuses now. Um, the players being unavailable. I think all Arsenal fans are getting a little bit sick of it. Uh, and like I said, it, it's time now to put up or shut up. And I won't be shutting up. Kate, you got anything wise to say on this? Or the puppies, do they have anything to say? I never have anything wise to say about anything. Just ask Gimli. What was the question? I you're the brains of the organisation. Oh, she's there. definitely the brains. I'm the fucking idiot. Well, you are a fucking idiot, but... You know, that's that's a different story. Yes. So, um, well, I can't find what the question was, because I'm doing seven things at once. Oh, oh was yeah, it it's... the failure? Yeah. Yes. I think it's definitely a missed opportunity, because we were doing so well, and now we're doing so shit. 
but definitely a waste opportunity and yes, a big we failure. We are no out of excuses. excuses. No, I'm done. Thought so. Okay, right. This is a fantastic question. Very rarely do I say go follow someone. Go and have a at T five zero red tone. What a question. If Armageddon happens and the scum win the league, what remote island will the panel retire to and should Arsene Wenger resign then? Um, Raj, I can hear you smirking. Zanzibar. Ah. There is no Wi-Fi there, so I won't have to watch <laughs> bloody l- l- read Twitter or anything. If If Tottenham win the league, I promise you now I'm going to leave this country and go to Zanzibar. I have too many... Spurs supporters in my family to be able to actually even it would be the end for me it just because of my situation with my family when my, a lot of them my cousins live in Edmonton and all that all that, all those areas I I'd have to move I would have to move oh my god what would you do Kate I would go to the island of Fernando's hey. Because it'd be chirpy and happy there. <laughs> and plenty of winkle. Um, Gilly, <laughs> talking about winkles, what would you do? I, I would quit the podcast and kill myself. But before I killed myself, <laughs> I would leave the world's angriest man, Jason Davies, to host the podcast. Oh, Jesus. Mr. Fife, what would you know? You've got your choice of uh, um, islands all over the world, having just been to the fifth best island in the world. Was it the fifth best hotel or fifth best island or both? Uh, fifth best hotel, yeah. Bloody hell. I showed the offspring a picture of that. She was uh, well gel, I think, as the kids say these days. <laughs> so where would you go? Or have you already been there? You just go back. I, I heard the, um, the B day was getting your bum cleaned by a small African child's tongue. That's how what exclusive this oh, hotel dear. is. I tried to uh, convince my girlfriend that I that I was uh, pleasantly surprised that in the toilet there was a toilet there for guys and a toilet for girls, pretending that I thought the the bidet was actually my toilet, not hers. Was it and, less uh, palm tree and more yew tree? Oh Jesus! <laughs> did you did you say, oh, this one I can put my my iPad on the cistern bit and watch it? That's what it's designed to face that way round for. Oh, lovely. So what it's, island would you go to then, It's Fife? the kind of hotel where they have a little rack on the side just so you can do your lines of cocaine in the bathroom. That exclusive. Oh, dear. I tell you what, if you didn't own this, we'd have fired you by now. I Shut know. up. Bringing it down to your level. Fife, what island? Uh, it's a small island called Cayo Leventado in the Caribbean Sea. Um, and if, uh, if, uh, if Tottenham won the league and you guys all fucked off, I'd take over the pod because you'd all be gone and I'd bring some decorum back to it. Oh, what, what? I would go and live on the Isle of Dogs because it's full of slags. <laughs> right. uh, if you do live on the Isle of Dogs, I apologise. All, right, all, so was... all I can afford is the kind of hotel where you sniff Ajax off of a tramp's funny. <laughs> not, we, like, could... not like Fife. Could we go to the island of Fuck It? Oh, dear. I think that's never going to happen because they wouldn't understand because the last time they won in the league it was in black and white. They wouldn't recognise it. Um, da, 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 da. There's a good one there from TMG, but... Uh, I'm not going to just moan about the only way you're going to get a season ticket if someone dies. And uh, Have we got Mark any funny Tag- ones? We got any Mark- funny yeah, ones? That Tones one was brilliant. Mark yeah, no, Tag- that's a funny on- one. Shut up, Tyrone's one was good. Right, Mark Tag, friend of the pod. I think he's in Australia, Is but he's funny? an Englishman. Oh, we're seeing him. No, it's uh, it's one for getting Raj riled up. All right, get his blood next. Boiling. No, would it really have been too bad to stay at Highbury? We've won two FA Cups since leaving. I'm sure we could have at least done that there, Raj Breach. No, not really. Actually, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm on breach on that one. It, the memories of Highbury will always stay with me for the rest of my life. It was a wonderful Hello, time. Kicks in. Hello, hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Sorry, no. I'm just saying that yeah. it's 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 the past, though. Do you know what I mean? It's we're, we're in a kind of we're never going to sustain uh, that for for years and years. And if we'd stayed there now, we would probably wouldn't we'd be struggling you know no if we'd have stayed there now stan wouldn't have just spent three quarters of a million do- billion dollars on buying a new bloody ranch yeah, that's that's, that's his, i mean you can't link the we would ranch have won more than, with, if staying with... there we'd have won more than two fa cups wouldn't we no with the team we had we wouldn't have had to sell all of our stars how would we've bought o- ozil and sanchez who had stayed at highbury look look i'm not i'm not saying anything against highbury it was it was a brilliant place but we got to move away from that you know i i'd love to go back and watch a game at Highbury again, but it's not going to happen and we can't keep harping on about the past. When I own it, it we've, got to, we've got to try and work out what's best for our future. The thing is, it's I've... all these people that go, oh, there's no, the Emirates, it has no history, but you have to make history. 
fuck. There's we plenty know. of history at Highbury. That's a ridiculous. No, 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 not not Highbury. No, I mean, yeah. the Emirates. Well, yeah, we've got to create it though, don't you? Yeah, exactly. You're right. It's right. spot on. It's I think on on Raj's point, I agree with Raj there that we do need to move on and move into the Emirates was the right time. Arsenal, you know, we we have we want to be this big, um, one of the world's biggest clubs, so we need to be playing in a world class facility. Um, but what I would say, just as devil's advocate, to the actual point and the actual question, if you look at it, did we need to move to the Emirates to maintain success? What you could say on the flip side to your argument, Raj, and, and whilst I do agree with you, I'd say when the club moved to the Emirates and decided to you know take on that debt, and this was before we knew Cronky was going to come in, before we knew who the investors were, you know, obviously. Cronkies come in coincided with some, the yeah, but it was uh, obviously it coincided with the you know the terrible news of Danny Fisman's, um, you know his, his cancer and stuff. So, but at that time we forecasted that we needed to increase gate revenue um, massively, but we didn't see then, or it wasn't you know our, when you look at um, Arsenal and the bond issuance. They didn't foresee how big TV revenue was going to become and how big you know, commercial revenue was going to become. So now we've got this huge money coming in from TV. We've got this huge money coming in from Puma, from uh, Fly Emirates. And it means that the, 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 kind of the need or that, that revenue stream from, from ticket revenue has become less significant to, to the club as what it was before when we made that decision to move. Albeit I support the move to the Emirates. I think it was, you know, we should be in a world-class facility. But at the time, what we forecasted, you know, we'd never forecasted commercial or TV revenue to take such a drive here. And so perhaps you could say that, you know, it wasn't as needed as much as we thought at the time. But, you know, in, in the long term, we can't be playing in a hybrid. For, that's, know, that's, a, that's, a fair po- that's a fair point. But we didn't also foresee oil money coming into the game as well. And if I think if we'd stayed there and the oil money had come in, which it was going to, would have been left in their slipstream by that by now. We're barely keeping up with them now. But if we'd stayed at Highbury, yeah, we'd be, we'd be miles and miles and miles behind. Um, I don't. And um, my argument is 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 we we all you know everyone who went to Highbury, whoever any of you, I know Jeff and 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 Holick and and and, and Chris and everyone else, you know Jason have been to Highbury. We we've, we we just, we just just cherish those memories. And and that's what they are. They are lovely memories of some great games, some dire games, some horrible, cold, kind of dark, dingy. You know, I mean, we've all got memories, and we should just. It, it, that's what it. That's what they are now. But harping on about why well, we should be going back there now. It's 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 pointless. It's silly, and I think we should just look forward to the future. And as a as a as a group of fans, we've got to work together to try and create that future for for generations to come. And that's that's why some of us campaign for it. Point. But I think the question was, if we'd have stayed there, would we have won more than just two FA Cups, yes or no? No. I say yes. I say no. No, I say Five. no. Um, that year, we became we came fourth in our last year at Highbury. Spurs got the shits on the last day of the window, so we, we got Champions League. We got to the Champions League final with a with a pretty shite defence, remember? So the team wasn't that bad, but, you know, albeit the team the, the couple of years after weren't too different. Thierry Henry was always going to leave. His heart was gone. You know, so would we? Would we? I think the team in our first few years at the Emirates was actually pretty good. Adebayo and Van Persie up front, Riziki and Kleb on the wings, Fabregas and Flaminia midfield, Nasri coming in. I don't think we would have done too much better at Highbury than what we did moving to the Emirates. Maybe in the a few years after it hurt us when you know Fabregas and Nasri left, and we had some real shite like Shamak and you know all that kind of stuff. Maybe in those years, but in the in the long run, I think you know moving to the Emirates is the right idea. The, Ad- the Adebayos and Van Persis didn't win a Premier League at the Emirates, so why would they have won a Premier League at the, yeah. em- uh, at the at Highbury? So, yeah, that, that's kind of, yeah. And when did, the, when did the oil money come in? Seven, 2007, eight? When was it? Or later? No, I can't remember. But... Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, it, was... it depends. I mean, you could say the oil money, Abramovich's money came in 2004, right? Right. But, um, well, yeah, City. And, then, and then Cities, was, I believe, was a, well, Faction Trinatra, the Thai president, came in first, remember? So he came in in about 2007, I believe, maybe 2008. Yeah. Um, they bought, yeah, they bought a billion company they brought in, in in their first year. So that was Srinatra. Now he um, was arrested in Thailand, and I believe um, they brought in the oil money on the last day of the transfer window. The year Rabinio came in, so was that 2008 or 2009? Yeah. When City, and that's when. So City were already rich from um, from the Thai president. He was arrested, and then they brought in obviously the uh, the, um, the mega mega money from the Middle East. Then, so yeah. 
Oh, there you go. Good, good, um, good question, though. That's a good question. Yeah, it is a good question. Probably a surprising answer. If anybody out there has any um, old newspaper clippings or they're still in online, I remember once reading in a paper or seeing a, a screen grab of it on, on Twitter of uh, it said Islington Council give Arsenal the go ahead to redevelop the ground to 52,000. Now, I definitely read that and no one has ever been able to find it. So uh, if anyone that does know where that is or what paper it was or how I can have a look at it, then I'd love to see it because uh, I'm sure they did get permission to fill the corners in and redevelop the, the clock end. Hey, well, if, if, if true, that would have been a good option. Hmm. That would have been a lovely option, actually. Also, also to remember, Phil, is when moving to the Emirates, the Arsenal developed you know, a, a property portfolio. So they sold off the old stadium. They've also developed Drayton Park. There's also other stuff in the pipeline. And so selling off that, those huge property, um, those property assets have actually enabled a lot of that cash in the bank. And, um, you know, obviously whether Arsenal decide to use it or not is, a, is another thing. But as, as um, Raj alluded to, players at Ozil have come in off the back of that cash. So it has enabled, you know, a, a firm financial base from, from top eight, which is going to be vital in, in future years if we did actually decide to start using it. All right, so there you go. That was the one and a half hour podcast. We're at one hour fifty five minutes, Gim. Wonderful. Beautiful. I better I better kick this shit on quickly then. Leicester <laughs> predictions. Um, I'm going two nil to Arsenal. Alexi Sanchez first goal. Um, Kate, I am going two one Arsenal with Vardy scoring first goal. Danny, I'm going to go. Uh, one nil Leicester. We're going to shit. No, two nil Leicester because they're going to score first. Then we're going to panic and try and get another. And I'm going to put Mares to score first. Okay, because uh, I'm always wrong. Two one, and I think Mares will score first and put the shits up us, and then we'll score two goals. Okay. So two one to Arsenal. Two one to Arsenal. Yep. Wonderful, uh, Andrew. I think uh, it's going to be five three Arsenal. Um, Giroud. Nice. He's just gambling now. He needs the points. <laughs> I put a pony on it. They're both attack. Both teams are going to be going for, it, aren't they? It's going to be a ding dong. But it's to kick off at twelve a fucking clock. I've got to set I'd my have to go to bed that. now to be up in oh, time, no. and it's on Sky Sports, so I can't even Chromecast it in the bedroom. Oh, you <coughs> bastards! God, I have to get up at eleven o'clock. It's probably still dark at eleven, isn't it? Yep. it Fuck. is. Danny, get, get the torches. Valentine's out. Day as well. Is it? No. Oh, I won't even be able to get past the front door with all those Valentine's cards coming through like it was last year. Right, um, I'm going to do shout outs and I'll start first. Uh, I've got two this week, two very quick ones. The first one is at Yonko Abs, who is at Y O N K O A B B Z. Um, no other reason that he asked me, and he's a cheeky monkey, so get following him. And the other one is to at underscore. Uh, uh, at art underscore of underscore football who do some very good um, sports merchandise and they've sent me or they are going to be sending me a little bit more of it next week so go and check them out and my Twitter feed uh, they've got some good deals coming up and I will be tweeting them so check them out do they do 5XL that's all I need to know Uh, yes they do Oh, lovely! There you go, fatties. Dig deep. Uh, yeah. Um, so <laughs> basically, uh, don't don't spend anything at Giacomo. Um, go to Fuck Art him. of Football. Um, Danny. Right. This one you follow. This person is called at two four seven dubstep. He was really. Is Jakarta in Indonesia? Yes, Raj would know yes, this because he's yes. a man of the world. Ah, well, this person's in Jakarta, Indonesia, and he uh, was very kind about the loan watch and he said he really likes it and he'd like a little bit more information I said that's very kind of you you will get my shout outs I spent the last five minutes looking for him so there you go say nice things about the pod you get paid back with exactly. platitudes and uh, I'd like to thank Matthew Carr the guy um, who is regularly posting on YouTube uh, saying what a wonderful job I'm doing of hosting the podcast uh, is, he, is he the one with the sex pest he, that's the one um, ah. I believe he said something about knobs in holes the other week and me yeah. um it's it's all a blur but uh i promise it will happen kate Good. yes okay danny you do realize that he likes your loan watch because he likes your inability to actually pronounce players names properly apcom i don't know what he's on about Ac-pom. trumped up charges hold on no 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 anyway my shout outs i no, have no, no. two one, two. two. One is for John, who is at the Guna Irish, because I asked you what my shower and he popped up. And the other one is for at Nilstar one, who is Potty Mouth Nil. Her. She's yeah. lovely. Give her she a follow. She's lovely. Yes, She's give her Potty a Mouth though. Have the puppies got a shout out to anybody? Um, the gentleman's nod in my case. No, so they just just like anyone who likes poo. Oh. Yes. Um, so. 
Who's next, Gim? <laughs> uh, uh, their shout is to I like milfs daily. Oh, hello. Yes, so that's that's where they're going from. Uh, a bit left field. Andrew? Uh, my shout-out this week is for Everton Football Club. Um, I think they've been for fantastic value this week for three reasons. Uh, first one, the Re- Roberto Martinez caught dancing. It was just nice to see, you know, seeing the human side of uh, of football sometimes. It was brilliant. You know, you get all these fans moaning, you know, why aren't you watching games? Why aren't you tactizing? They need to have a laugh. Um Secondly, Bill Kenwright, uh, Everton were leading the vote for the away ticket, um, so a £30 standardised ticket for away fans, and it was Everton that led the vote uh, in favour of that, um, and, and, uh, and, unfort- well, yeah, and unfortunately Arsenal led the vote against it, and Ooh. so the motion didn't pass, uh, even though it would have meant a better deal for Arsenal fans because we pay the most everywhere we go. They don't um, give a fuck. Also, they, uh, their fans voted uh, a, a nine-year-old kid, George Shaw, um, was voted the Everton goal of the month, and he's a kid who uh, has mm, cerebral yeah, palsy. Yeah, I saw that. And he came on and he scored a goal at half-time, and, and, and the poor lad can barely, can barely walk. And it, was, it was a great touch by a club I, I have a lot of admiration for, um, and I think they've shown a lot of class this week in a time where, uh, where the wider football uh, family haven't. Mm, here, here. Very, nice. Very well said, Andrew. Um, I should also uh, say that I wanted to give a shout out to my bizarrest Twitter follower of the week, who is Places I've Pooed. Um, <laughs> he followed me a couple of days back, and I'd just like to inform everybody um, he's just achieved splashdown in the Maldives. Uh, Raj. <laughs> At Mark THG. Uh, that's the only shout I've got tonight. He just basically agrees with everything I say, which makes me feel nice. Mm. There you go. You heard the, the good news about um, who blocked us. Who's, who was blocked? The crazy lady! Uh, she unfollowed everyone and blocked the podcast who? account. Who? Oh, oh, I can't say her name. She's probably come around and killed Gimli. Who's basically, that? it's this woman. She is a nutcase. She wanted to buy one of our puppies. And then I basically oh, had, yeah, 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 yeah. I had to turn around and say, listen, love, you are a fucking sandwich short of a picnic. There is no way Easy that, tiger. That, that you are ever, ever... I, I wouldn't even leave you in a room with a, a stuffed animal, let alone a fucking real one. So, no, she politely got told that she was an utter. And um, well, the good news is she's fucked off. So, yeah, we've won. Um, so we've is given there... the love to the fans. That's yeah. what we love. Oh, and we, listeners, well, not um, fans. And this is how we value all of our listeners. Thank you so yes. much for, um, indeed, listening and uh, participating in this week's podcast. Um, and a thank you to all of my guests that have joined me, uh, Raj, Andrew, and Kate. Danny, unfortunately, me? you have yes. to be here. Oh, fuck. Um, that's <sighs> all about it for tonight, then, guys and, yeah. and gal. Uh, so that was a Burkamp Wonderland podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And keep it, Arsenal. Good night. Cronky out. Vote for me. Best three words this evening, Gabriel, Caribbean, and mendacious. Thank you. And if that doesn't make you your mouth water, check your Skype in two seconds. What are you going to do? I'm going to put a picture oh. of a spatchcock chicken onto your chat. To be thing. honest with you, Raj, I'm already erect. <laughs> oh, look at that. Look at that. That is a spatchcock chicken. Look how it... Oh, it's so juicy. Danny. Well yes. Can you adopt me? Because <laughs> I'm going to have my driving lessons. She wants, when, she wants a car. Cell, Cheeky and bitch. then you can buy me my first car. Uh, yeah, maybe, yeah. I, 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 I don't want a golf. Moment. I don't nice. want a golf. I just want a nice little, simple, nice, bright car. I just can a li- imagine. Just a little slow thing. I can imagine if if 
Danny, where, you take a bath at your brother's house, don't you? Uh, yeah, until my one's done, yeah. If you were like in the... I'm out. <laughs> I was going to say fecal position, but that's shit, isn't it? If you were in the fetal position... <laughs> when I'm having a shit in the bath. <laughs> in the bath, right, and your house burned down around you, yeah. I could imagine, right, slightly charged, you'd look a bit like a spatchcock chicken. <laughs> broiled. A broiled I'm spatchcock chicken. chicken. <laughs> Bubba, can we sell your car because Kate wants a car? No? Apparently just, Kate is a no. Sure. Are, are if, you sure? She but can she has, have a puppy. You can just swap your car for a puppy. She, she hates dogs, you're, you're knackered. If you had a kitten... An 11 plate sea max. A kitten? She can have a kitten. You get a three ginger kittens, call them all Ken, job done. Done. We call, no, we call, we call the ginger one because he's a bit rapey. We call him Ian. Because it's, it's a rapey name. Actually, her, <laughs> her mum's dog is, is actually called Ian. Oh, that's terrible. And he is a bit of a nonce. Oh, We've got a Berg, physical Berg, date. Bergie's had the um, recycling box out, by the way, apparently. Oh, my Bergie's just come in and gone out again. He's got the ump because there's stuff on, his, on the... the... They do have a All right, guys, I've got to go, so I will talk to you a bit later on. Cheers you know for the spatchcock chicken. Have... I'm going to have spatchcock chicken tomorrow, stroke myself, and think of you, Raj. Excellent. Have a wank. See you later. (laughs) See ya. Bye. 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 So what what that's going to be, it's going to be a spatchcock Kiev chicken (laughs) with a special filling. (laughs) It is. If you pitch his leg, he... He farts. He farts. Uh, well, what, Creamy what goodness. <laughs> Garlic butter. <laughs> that would be, uh, it'd be ginger goblin butter. Oh. Or oh, when you dear. mix um, icing sugar with water, that kind of paste that it makes, fill you it can, with that. You can, uh, what's the one where you can you do that? Oh, it's a corn flour and water, and it's a solid and a liquid all at once. Hey, eh? Magic. Uh. You done that? Nope. You can get it, and you mix it together, and it'll pour. But if you filled a swimming pool full of it, you could walk across it, and you wouldn't sink. Jesus, you're like a modern-day Betty Crocker. Well, any any wise words on that, Mr. Fife? I think we could have gone on for another two hours talking about that stuff. Oh, he's, he's just spooning caviar into his anus. Are <laughs> <laughs> oh, you going to propose to her yet? Give it a week? No. Have you no. proposed to Kate yet? No, no he fucking hasn't. Bastard. That's he I, would. To be honest with you, I, I, I'm just not sure yet. I'm still still <laughs> just, just, <laughs> treading on trodden well, ground. Don't think that I haven't got other offers in the pipeline. Tell you what, Raj has been DMing her. It or, wasn't. Yeah. I just I just a Wonka cheese. bar up my ass. <laughs> Is that why you wake up with shit stains every morning? No, that's because you put a chocolate button between my ass cheeks. No, it isn't, because I don't have any chocolate buttons. It was a white chocolate button. I thought someone had come up my (laughs) butt. What, like a Cadbury's cream egg? I'm going to do that. I'm going to put a Cadbury's cream egg by his bum cheeks He wouldn't even notice for about a month. He probably wouldn't. I'll walk along and say, oh, I need a poo. (laughs) I laid an egg. (laughs) I'll stop an egg. (laughs) Have you ever frozen one of them Cadbury's cream eggs? Oh, what? You didn't live. But you could murder someone with a frozen cream egg. You could murder someone with a normal egg, just chuck them at people. They cringe and then it hits them in the head. Oh, you'd do some damage, though, wouldn't you, with a frozen one? A frozen crappy scream egg. Go and get yourself some, the frozen mint one. Oh, how shut up. How many, you reckon, how many do you reckon you could fit up there, Fife? I don't know, mate. I, uh, I'm pretty it's, tight. It's not his department. <laughs> you know, I, get the, I get the impression from Adrian, he's like, oh, these people are so below me. <laughs> no, not at all. I was just uh, monging out. <laughs> he's multitasking. Are you having nice a spliff? Talking. No, no, it's, no, it's not. When was the you? last time you smoked a joint, Andrew? I, I'm not going to have a dirty, stinking pothead on my podcast. How are you guys all doing anyway? All good? Do you enjoy? I thought tonight's podcast was quite good, no? I would yeah. I could have done three hours. So much more stuff I wanted to talk about. Ticket yeah. wise and... We barely even touched upon Arsenal and the away ticket stuff. Mm. And like, there's lots of figures this week. I think Kino's did something against She Wore. About you know, it looked at the cost of what every club's away fans pay at Arsenal and what oh, yeah, pay at their ground. That. Yeah, they like we pay like nearly sixty quid to go to West Ham, where they pay like twenty six thousand and stuff. Should be parity, shouldn't it? Yeah, but Arsenal voted against parity, so yeah, even, though yeah, even though it would benefit, even though it would have benefited our fans massively. Yeah, they don't care That's though, do they? Because most of them probably don't go away. The ones that go to the home games. Yeah, I've got a dilemma. Time. 
Um, is that a new chocolate bar? Do you know, yeah. Sticking out your bum. Do you know um, 